Are we ready? I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, High County Board of Commissioners to order for April the 6th. Uh, this is a very unusual meeting we're having tonight under the circumstances that we're having to meet. Uh, we are streaming live on uh, Facebook, and this meeting is being recorded, which will be posted on the High County website after the meeting. And uh, also, there was a call-in number that was sent out with the, with the public notice of the meeting on Saturday, I believe. So those that uh, have called in and can't see, I, I'm going to... We have here on the mainland, we have Commissioner uh, James Toppin, Commissioner Shannon Swindell, Commissioner Earl Pugh, Commissioner Benjamin Simmons, County Manager Chris Noble, Attorney Franz Holscher, and Board Clerk uh, Lois Stokesbury, and IT person Donnie Shoemate. And we have Tom Paul, live streaming from his home because we have some problems with the Okra Coat television. We also have Luana Gibbs online and Justin Gibbs. So uh, with that being said, welcome everyone that's listening and and watching. And now we will, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Benjamin if he would open us with our opening prayer. If you will, bow. Lord, we just come to you tonight and we just ask for guidance in all we do. And Lord, we're in uncharted territory and we just, uh, we need guidance and wisdom through this time. We ask for guidance for, from our national leaders. And Lord, we just ask that you be with our medical providers and help us get solutions to these problems really quick so we can get our lives back to normal. We ask that tonight as we uh, move forward, let these things be pleasing to you. And may it be the best things for the residents of Hyde County. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll let's pledge allegiance to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have an agenda before you. Uh, do I have any uh, additions or any changes to the agenda? No, sir. Hearing none, all those in favor Mr. of the chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, there were two items at our last meeting that were, one was tabled to the April 6th meeting and one was continued to the April 6th meeting and neither of them appear on the agenda. And I'm just wondering what the intent is about those. One was the, uh, we had a public hearing that we had begun at the last meeting and it was continued uh, to the April 6th meeting. And the other was um, a proclamation regarding dig safe and that was tabled to the April 6th meeting. I don't know if we need to address those in some manner. Um, Commissioner Paul, I'm happy to talk about those. Are you referring to the public hearing for the flood ordinance? Yes, correct. Yes, sir. After I reviewed the public hearing for the flood notice with Ms. Hodges, um, we decided that in order for us to properly hold a public hearing, we needed a a as close to um, proposed draft as possible available on the website for public viewing, which we had not had available for public viewing. And so she is working towards having that flood ordinance placed on our website, in which case, and we also have an advertising requirement for that public hearing. Um, and so what our plan is, sir, is to place that uh, draft or proposed um, flood ordinance on our website, and it'll be advertised in the paper um, two weeks prior to our May meeting and one week prior to our May meeting so that we are able to ensure that we have proper advertisement of that public hearing. It's also quite tricky to hold a public hearing right now in these times where our limit, where our public is somewhat limited in all getting together and congregating. And we thought that with the flood ordinance being such an important topic, 
we hope that we can meet in a normal, more normal fashion for our May meeting and hold that flood ordinance properly advertised with as much um, potential for public comment as possible. Sure, and I don't have a problem with any of that. I just wondered that because we continued that public hearing, it's in effect still active. Do we need to close that public hearing or just continue it again or, or what? It's, it's kind of a technical issue, I realize. Yes, sir, I'm gonna refer that and ask for some advice from County Attorney Holscher. Believe it or not, um, Chris and I talked about this uh, briefly this afternoon. Um, I've not uh, personally had the occasion to be in this situation before. I do note that um, the public hearing was not actually closed at the last meeting and it was continued until tonight. So what you could consider doing if you want to try to clean it up is you could amend your agenda to add the public hearing um, to the night's uh, agenda. And then when you get to that item, simply continue it again before you do anything. Um, I, I would need to think about it a little bit more, but right now off the cuff, I think that it would still be wise to um, republish your notice and advertise it, especially because I understand there may be revisions and they may be significant. So um, you, you probably want to do that again anyway. Okay. So we, would we add number 10 as public hearing? Um, or I guess that we could potentially um, amend the public hearing section between the minutes and the presentation for the flood um, okay. pre flood prevention ordinance. Correct. Okay, and then the item that was tabled, should that be on the agenda as well so that we can table that further or is that not as critical an issue? Oh, well, to be quite honest with you, sir, with everything that's happened with COVID-19, I knew we would not get a representative from the, the what is it, 811 safe digging line, most yes. state representatives, and I kind of put that one on the back burner for now. And so we will not pass a proclamation tonight in regard to 811, but we can, pending, um, how the COVID restrictions go potentially invite um, the 811 representatives to the May meeting, if that's what everybody would like. That makes sense to me. All right, are there any other changes to the agenda? Your motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Have a motion by. Benjamin Simmons, do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Swindell. Are there any more discussion? No, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All, all opposed? Motion carried. We have the minutes for the March 2nd regular meeting. Uh, are there any corrections to those minutes? I have a couple, couple of corrections, three of them. Uh, on page one of the minutes, line 28, um, it's actually, it's actually in regards to I believe it was in regards to an to a, a correction to the previous month's minutes, but on that line 28 uh, or 27 and 28, where it starts and it says and on page seven line 33, uh, that was not my correction to the minutes from that point forward. They 
the previous portion of that was a correction that I recommended, but on starting on line 27 with the word and, that was not a correction that I suggested. I believe it was suggested by uh, Commissioner Topping. So you're saying, Commissioner, you didn't make the motion for that? Starting with the word and on line 27, my my motion to uh, make a change to the minutes ends at the end of line 27. And then there was another motion, I believe. But the remainder of that was not my correction to the minutes. So Commissioner Paul, we could put, he also suggested that item D under section 34.1 be changed, period. And then strike and on page seven, line 33 through 34. Yes, that's right. I did not make that amendment. All right, you got that correction, Chris? It's Ms. Lois. Or Ms. Lois. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Also, um, on the second page of the minutes, line 48, it says Tom Payne of Ocracoke spoke in the public comments. It wasn't Tom Payne, it was Tom Kane, C A I N. Thank and you, then, sir. On, then on line 51, where it says those various people spoke at the public comment period and that they do not support proposed changes to the Second Amendment, that's just not an accurate description of what was going on. They spoke because they were not in favor of the resolution that was proposed regarding the Second Amendment. I saw that too, Tom, and I think it, it should read, do not, did not, do not support resolution to the Second Amendment, not changes. Correct. The resolution that referred to the Second Amendment. Right. Yes, sir, we can make the change to reflect that. And on Page three, line 45, does the motion passed on the following votes? Eyes, Paul Pugh, Simmons, Swindell, and Toppings. Um, there was actually two no votes and I was one of them. And to be honest, I don't know who the second no vote was. It was Commissioner Toppin. All right, so that's, Inaccurate. Yes, sir. There were, two, there were two no votes. Correct. Any other corrections? That's it. Anyone else have any corrections? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes as corrected? So moved. A motion by Commissioner Swindell. Is there a second? Second. Second. Simmons, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. All right, now we have the March, the special emergency meeting minutes for March 18th. Are there any corrections to those minutes? If not, do I hear a motion to approve them as presented? So moved. A motion by Commissioner Swindell. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Simmons. Is there any further discussion? 
If not, all those in favor, let me know by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Yes. Just, I'd like to, just a moment. I, I miss somebody that's present here on the mainland. Uh, Sheriff Barcahoon is also present here at the mainland. And that makes, I think, nine people here. So we're below the 10 uh, rule of, of meeting together. All right, Chris. Yes, sir. Um, in regard to the public hearing for the flood prevention ordinance that was started at our um, March meeting to be continued um, tonight, we would like to further continue the flood prevention ordinance public hearing to our May meeting. Um, in order to receive as much public comment as possible, we will be um, putting out the draft flood prevention ordinance in the paper and on our website in the coming weeks, and it will be properly advertised prior to the May meeting. So we would like for the board to continue the public hearing on the flood, flood prevention ordinance until our May meeting. So moved. So moved. I have a motion by uh, to continue the uh, public hearing on, on the, what was it, the? Flood prevention flood, ordinance. Flood ordinance until the May meeting. I believe I have a uh, motion by Commissioner Paul and a second by Commissioner Simmons. Is there any more discussion? Not all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Tonight, gentlemen, we have several presentations for you. Um, due to our, our social distancing restrictions, we're going to try our hand at doing these online. Our first presentation is our uh, superintendent of the Park Service, Superintendent Dave Hallett, who will be presenting the 2019 year in review. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, for the opportunity to present tonight. And uh, Donnie, if you could let me know when the presentation is loaded and ready. Looks like it's there. Do you all see it? I see it. Okay, great. So this is uh, going to be a little bit different than it would be, of course, if I was with you. I really appreciate Donnie's flexibility in, in helping me uh, email this to him and, and present it. I just want to start out just with a quick understanding of uh, what the National Parks of Eastern North Carolina are. They're your national parks. There are five of them. They're Wright Brothers Memorial, Fort Raleigh National Historic Site on Roanoke Island, Cape Hatteras National Seashore, which is 67 miles and, of course, includes uh, Ocracoke Island and Hyde County, Cape Lookout National Seashore, which is 58 miles, and Moores Creek National Battlefield, which is just north west of Wilmington. Uh, and combined, Cape Hatteras Seashore and Cape Lookout Seashore make up uh, a significant portion of coastal eastern North Carolina. So I'm responsible for Wright Brothers, Cape Hatteras, and Fort Raleigh, and I supervise the superintendents at Cape Lookout and Morse Creek. We share a variety of positions and uh, work very well together. Next slide, Donnie. And I'm going to try to go through these slides real quickly, and you've seen some of this before, but in terms of the three parks, Cape Hatteras, Wright Brothers, and Fort Raleigh, uh, over the last year we had about 81 staff. We brought in 100 seasonal staff during the summer. We had a lot of volunteer hours. We had over three and a quarter million visitors, almost 80,000 overnight camping stays, and we have a lot of different buildings and septic systems and water treatment plants, five visitor centers, and all of this is done with a budget of uh, just over $15 million. Some of that money comes from Congress. Some of the money comes from offer of vehicle permit sales. Some comes from camping and lighthouse climbing. And then we're also lucky to have some donations. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the last year started out a little bit rough for the National Park Service. You may uh, recall that we had a 35-day government shutdown. It was the longest. Uh, government shutdown that I'm aware of in the history of the nation, uh, and it was challenging for us, uh, but we got through it, and uh, we were back up and running in February and very happy to be back at work. Next slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through this graph in detail, but what I want you to know and, and, and 
The reason we look at this, by the way, is this can impact the visitor season. 2019 was a warm year with average rainfall. If you look at most of the months in the year 2019, the maximum and minimum temperature was significantly higher than the 30 year average. Uh, but when you look at the rainfall, all combined, we were just about average, and that's denoted by the red bar all the way at the right hand corner of the graph on the bottom. Next slide, Donnie. Uh, interestingly, 2020 has been a very dry year overall so far. In uh, March we and February we had some rain, but it turned out that January was the driest the January we've had since 1957 with only one, about one and a half inches of rain. Next slide, Donnie. Uh, the visitation at Cape Hatteras National Seashore in 2019 was the highest that we've seen in 16 years. Uh, we broke the 2.6 million visitor mark. The visitation was only up by 0.6%, but that's a lot. That's more than 15,000 people. Next slide, please. Uh, we often get a lot of questions about off-road vehicle use uh, on both Ocracoke and Hatteras and Body Islands. What I wanted you to know is that off-road vehicle activity at the seashore is still very popular. Last year was a record year for off-road vehicle permit sales. We sold over 42,000 permits. Uh, compared to where we were back in 2012, you can see we've had quite an increase in the popularity of off-road vehicle use at the seashore. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a new philanthropic partner that is assisting the, uh, the parks in eastern North Carolina called Outer Banks Forever. Their uh, purpose is to help raise funding to help these parks reach a margin of excellence. Uh, they're just up and running over the last year. Uh, there's no question that this year with the impacts of COVID-19 that uh, philanthropy is going to be a challenging uh, area to work in. Uh, nevertheless, it's really nice to have a professional support group that is trying to help uh, support the national parks in eastern North Carolina. Next slide, please. Some other highlights, uh, the Oregon Inlet Marina, which is just up the road from all of you, is a 57-boat charter fishing marina, and we just entered into a new 20-year lease with a new operator. In addition to the operator uh, refurbishing the entire seawall around the marina, they will be in the coming years uh, rebuilding the fishing center building so that it's higher, less exposed to storms, and uh, much more sustainable for the future. Next slide. Uh, we also received about $6 million in money from federal highways to help with what's called pavement preservation. These are projects that take good pavement, for example, the Ocracoke uh, boat ramp, also known as the base docks parking, and puts a coating of either pavement or chip sealing, which is a gravel with an asphalt binder, to help protect the high quality pavement underneath. Uh, a lot of the parking areas on Ocracoke uh, are going to be uh, implemented with pavement preservation, and we're really lucky to have this $6 million grant from Federal Highways. Next slide, please. Uh, we had a major incident on uh, Hatteras Island in Frisco during the year 2019, and I, and I show this to you because it's a testament to the incredible uh, power of community that we have both on Hatteras Island and Ocracoke Island as well. If you go to the next slide, Donnie, you'll see that uh, we had a real mess on the beach that stretched for many miles. You can see the photograph on the left on February 4th, and two days later on February 6th, due to dozens and dozens of volunteers that came out, we were able to clean up the beach and make it look like new. We continue to really appreciate the support that we have from the Hatteras Island and Ocracoke Island communities. Next slide. We made some enhancements at the Oregon Inlet Campground, added power and water to about 50 sites. We would like to do that on Ocracoke Island as well. Uh, it's going to be an expensive project, but we endeavor to make that happen over the coming years. Next slide. Uh, we were very happy and pleased to implement a new lifeguard stand in Frisco. So now all of the beach parking areas at Cape Hatteras Seashore uh, at Coquina Beach, at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, in Frisco, and on Ocracoke Island have a lifeguard on duty during the summertime. Next slide, please. 
We also partnered with Dare County and implemented a, a Love the Beach, um, Respect the Ocean campaign. We've uh, sent out thousands, if not tens of thousands of these cards, which allow uh, folks, visitors to, to get a daily beach conditions text message from Dare County, and it helps to advise them of days that are dangerous to swim in the ocean due to the likelihood of rip currents. Next slide, please. Uh, the Wright Brothers Visitor Center was completely rehabilitated and the Visitor Center achieved our LEED Gold certification. We're very proud of that. Next slide. We also implemented a new parking area, which you probably see on your way up to uh, Hatteras Island uh, called the Kite Point Parking Area. This was a location where there were sometimes hundreds of cars parked on the side of the road in a very dangerous situation. We made a primitive parking area, got them off the road, and the improved the safety. Area, which probably see. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, we were very proud to continue to participate with uh, NCDOT on the Ocracoke Express. As you all know, I think over 30,000 people rode the passenger ferry. Very successful project. Uh, you may or may not also know that Cape Hatteras National Seashore is the federal sponsor on the passenger ferry project. The passenger ferry project was funded largely by a federal lands access program grant from federal highways. And those are grants that, that connect areas of federal lands for the purposes of recreation. So we were proud to be able to support that project and excited about the success and look forward to the future. Next slide, please. We had the uh, 50th anniversary of the lunar landing celebration at Wright Brothers. Next slide. We also celebrated the 20 year anniversary of the moving of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Next slide. We also were really proud to participate in a community day and in a grand uh, reopening and ribbon cutting of the new Basnight Bridge. Uh, this bridge is almost entirely on Cape Hatteras National Seashore property, and it was a real pleasure to work with everybody, including Federal Highways, NCDOT, and all of the local and state partners to make this project happen. A great day. Next slide, please. Uh, we also held the first surf fishing heritage celebration in Buxton. Uh, the photograph you see of all the women at the table was a women in surf fishing uh, seminar in which uh, many uh, women who have great expertise in surf fishing shared their knowledge and told very uh, funny and entertaining stories. Next slide, please. We also implemented an accessible hunting blind and wildlife viewing platform in one of the federal federally designated hunting areas on Body Island. Next slide. And we had some great successes in regard to wildlife management. If you had asked me what a good year for sea turtle nesting was a decade ago, I'd tell you 50 or maybe 75 sea turtle nests. In the year 2019, we had 473 sea turtle nests at Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We're really starting to see the fruits of an incredible number of conservation efforts over the last few decades. Next slide, please. So things were going fairly well until September 6th, and I don't need to tell all of you in the room there what happened. Hurricane Dorian uh, made the path, which is noted on uh, this slide here. Next slide. And you can see exactly what happened here uh, when, when uh, Congressman Greg Murphy came uh, to Ocracoke Island, I printed this out for him so he could really see the magnitude of the impact of the storm surge from Pamlico Sound on Ocracoke Island. And this graph really tells it all. Uh, on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see the tide going up and down and up and down just as it does every day. And this gauge, by the way, is at NC Cat, right by the Silver Lake Ferry Docks. And you can see what happened on Friday morning. The water level shot up almost seven feet and covered the island in Pamlico Sound waters. It also came down fairly quickly, but we know that the impact of that uh, wall of water was lasting and severe to the island. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a photograph of me a couple of days afterwards showing you one of the uh, uh, areas of highway damage. You're all well aware of this. Next slide. 
this is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse grounds after the water went down. Next slide. Uh, a photograph of one of the sheds next to the Cape Hatteras, uh, sorry, um, Ocracoke uh, Lighthouse. This shed actually is not supposed to be oriented the way it is. It was floated off of its foundation. You can see the foundation bricks to the left of the structure. Next slide. You can see the water line in the double keepers quarters of the uh, the uh, Ocracoke Lighthouse. Again, conditions that were very similar to many of the residents on the island. Most of our structures had some level of water damage or flooding. Uh, the double keepers quarters at the lighthouse had some fairly severe impacts. Uh, essentially, everything in the ground floor of the building was uh, badly flooded. Next slide. Uh, you are also aware that the uh, not only the storm, but the additional storms that came later continues to have impacts on the stacking lanes at the north end of Ocracoke. Next slide. And uh, it also had impacts to a lot of our buildings. Uh, we had roof damage on most of the structures. Next slide. Uh, this is a storage shed that uh, actually had the walls blown off of it uh, from the flood waters that got in, and uh, it did not have flood vents, so you can see what happened here. Next slide. Uh, amazingly, many species of wildlife actually did okay during the storm. I guess they 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 build their their nests to last. Uh, this is a great photograph of a sea turtle nest that was severely impacted by Hurricane Dorian. We were actually able to save the large majority of those eggs and they hatched. Next slide, please. Um, this is a photograph actually not of the spoil pile uh, or not of the C&D pile on Ocracoke Island, but of the debris pile on uh, Hatteras Island at the old Navy base. Uh, that was the second location that we permitted a debris staging for all the damages on Hatteras Island. Next slide. And uh, I love this photograph of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore Ocracoke Island airstrip because it goes to show you just how much support uh, and love came in to Ocracoke Island and the community. On the right hand side, you can see five wall tents that are air conditioned that at one time had 70 people living in them. You see numerous tractor trailers. This area served as a, uh, a very important recovery point for the first few days and weeks of the storm, uh, or following the storm. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the changes to the island. If you look at the big sandbar, this is the <laughs> south end of Ocracoke Island, that's South Point. You look at this big sandbar that's there, and that sandbar has been there for a long time. It almost looks like a boot uh, that is facing to the left. And what you see on the uh, blue and red lines is what the island looks like since Hurricane Dorian. The blue line is what the island looked like uh, just about two weeks after the storm. And the red line is what the island looked like in the middle of February. So the island is growing back a little bit, but there has been an incredible loss of sand and uh, sand volume from Ocracoke Island. Next slide. You also see similar things on the north side of the island. Uh, this photograph is an area of the island from before Hurricane Dorian, and you see a black line. The black line is a shoreline trace that we did after the storm, and you can see that an incredible amount of the shoreline was lost from Dorian. Next slide. Uh, if Dorian was not enough, uh, in October, we had Tropical Storm Melissa that came in, and this is the Avon Pier, which is a Cape Hatteras National Seashore property, and you can see some of the impacts we had to that. Uh, we are still trying to implement repairs there. Next slide. And if that wasn't enough, in November, we had an unnamed nor'easter that came through, and the combination of Melissa and the nor'easter did significantly more damage to the dunes on Ocracoke Island and the north end of the island next to Highway 12 than uh, Hurricane Dorian did. Next slide. Uh, this is a photograph of the north end of Ocracoke Island, uh, and you can see the sand that was put back to rebuild the dunes. But really what's more impressive about this photograph 
is what you see in front of you, that dark mass that looks like maybe, maybe it looks like seaweed or, or something like that. That is actually organic marsh soil. And it goes to show you just how much erosion has occurred on the north end of the island. That historic marsh used to be in Pomlico Sound. And there has been so much erosion of the island that that is now on the beachfront. Next slide, please. So where are we going? I'm going to start by saying I am very, despite all of these pictures of damages, I am very optimistic about recovery of Cape Hatteras National Seashore assets and properties when it comes to Hurricane Dorian. We're making tremendous efforts already cleaning up the row side. We have a contract that is underway today where we are completely redoing the uh, Ocracoke Island Visitor Center. Uh, it was badly flooded, but we're having new floors put in. We're re replacing the walls. We're replacing the HVAC system. And uh, we're in a position that should the island uh, open up soon, we hope to be ready to go. We're also fixing all of our housing so that we can continue to have staff on the island and take care of our resources and our visitors. We're making repairs at the campground, and we're going to undergo a planning process to determine what we should do to fix the lighthouse area. But that first bullet there is one of five priorities for Cape Hatteras National Seashore for the next three years, and you notice that it's right there up top. Second priority is the revitalization of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. We're lucky to be in line for funding to redo the lighthouse, and a significant amount of planning is underway right now. Another priority is to continue to adapt to a dynamic coast. We're working very closely with NCDOT and others on ways to adapt our roadways, our parking areas, and our facilities to make them as resilient as possible uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. We're working on some improvements at Wright Brothers, and finally, we're working on improving our housing for our staff. Much of our housing was uh, really is, is composed of uh, old double wide trailers from the 1960s, particularly on Hatteras Island. And it's time for us to renovate that and put, put that housing in a position where we can better support our staff. So that's all I have to share with you tonight. I very much appreciate the opportunity to present to you. Uh, we strongly support Hyde County's efforts to mitigate impacts of COVID-19. We know this is going to be a challenging spring and summer. But we're right there with you and uh, look forward to doing whatever we can to support all of you. Happy to take any questions you may have. Superintendent Hollick, we appreciate um, the Park Service. We appreciate you coming here tonight and, and, and presenting the 2019 year in review. And we certainly appreciate your partnership over the last year and, and the last several years. Um, I can't tell you how much you've meant to Hyde County in regard to recovery from Dorian, um, just for one example. I'd like to open up um, any questions from the board that you may have for the superintendent or comments. No question, but a comment. I would just reiterate um, what Chris said, how important um, uh, the Park Service and Dave, you in particular, have, have been um, in in working with us through the recovery from, from Dorian. And we're just uh, extremely grateful for the help that you've provided. I'd like to echo Tom's comments too. Uh, Dave, you all have been, uh, if it wasn't for the Park Service, we wouldn't have had the place to put all the debris in and the staging area at the uh, boat ramp parking area. So we really do appreciate all you've done for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Paul. It's our pleasure and uh, we feel like we're part of the Hyde County family and uh, look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you again, sir, for that valuable update. The next presentation on our agenda will be our High County Health Director, Ms. Luana Gibbs, Ms. Luana Gibbs, and she will give us a COVID-19 update. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I'm going to discuss our favorite topic, which is COVID-19. 
COVID-19, for just a very brief background, is a coronavirus that affects the respiratory system of individuals. Most people recover well, some become severely ill, and unfortunately, there are those who die. COVID-19 has been declared a pandemic, which simply means that the illness is spread over the world. This illness is spread by respiratory droplets, which come from coughing, sneezing, talking, and singing. The best way to prevent the spread, I've mentioned many times, and I know you all have heard and read many times, but it still bears repeating. The best way to prevent the spread is to wash your hands frequently with soap and water for 20 seconds, or to use a hand sanitizer with 60% alcohol. Cover your cough and sneeze, throw away the tissue you cover with, or cough and sneeze in your elbow. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces many times a day. And of course, reduce the number of people that you're exposed to and practice social distancing, which is six feet apart from one another. Follow the current executive orders and stay at home except for travel that is required, such as to work if you have an essential job, get groceries, go to the doctor, or go to the pharmacy. And now, um, recently, CDC has just implemented new recommendations for people who do have to travel into the community to get groceries or go to the pharmacy, put cloth face coverings on. And if you go to the CDC website, you'll actually see where the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Adams, is um, showing us how we can create our own cloth mask at home. So now I'll give you some statistics from North Carolina DHS. Um, as of 11 o'clock this morning, there were 40,726 tests that had been um, completed in North Carolina. There were 2,870 confirmed cases by the test, which was an 800 person increase from Friday. There had been 270 hospitalizations and 33 deaths. Uh, Misty Gibbs, my preparedness coordinator, has just given me updated figures. There are now 3,037 cases in North Carolina with 41 fatalities, and there are now 90 counties in the state who have COVID-19. Of the deaths, 94% are people who are 50 years old or older and 41% of the lab confirmed cases are individuals that are 25 to 49. The 90 counties that have confirmed cases, Hyde is not one of those counties. We are one of the 10 that does not have a confirmed case. But there are some reasons for this, likely because we're testing fewer and fewer individuals based on guidelines that we've received from DHHS. We've chosen not to disclose the number of tests that we've performed because we don't want to create false hopes or false fears. And we've done this in conjunction with other counties that neighbor us. Please, please don't be mistaken by the fact that we have no confirmed cases or don't. Please do not lower your guard. It doesn't mean that it's not here. It just means we don't have a lab confirmation. Reasons we might not have lab confirmation is simply because there are some people who have had no symptoms or minimal symptoms. We've had people who've had symptoms but maybe chose not to seek medical care. There are people who sought medical care but maybe were not tested. And then there's always the potential that a test with COVID-19 can report that it's negative when in fact it's positive. Some strategies that the state's taking or working towards is surveillance methods. The state currently does that for influenza. It's called syndromic surveillance. And what they do is they have hospitals report to them when there are individuals who have respiratory illnesses. The same strategy is going to be adopted for COVID-19. 
NC Detect is also another strategy that's employed where hospitals report from their emergency departments the number of people who have respiratory illness. Today I watched Secretary Mandy Cohen speak and she said that if we were to stop social distancing by April 30th, that by June the 1st, we could easily have 750,000 people in North Carolina who are infected with COVID-19. I don't want to be doom and gloom. We all have an awful lot to be thankful for. We just need to be very mindful of what's among us and do everything that we can to prevent the spread. That's my update. Thank you, um, Health Director Gibbs. Are there any questions from our board for Ms. Luana? Just two real quick ones, Luana. You and I talked about this a little bit before. What's the uh, the return time on, on test, test results? I guess they're tested at the state lab. They're actually tested at the state lab and at several commercial labs. The state lab gives us a 24-hour turnaround time, but many of the commercial labs like LabCorp can take from seven to 10 days. And my last question, we, we discussed this, we talked about this I think a couple weeks ago. Is there an official, is there an official or not value attached to this COVID-19 yet or is it varying as depending on where it's at? I've seen 2.5. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I, I, my I question is, oh, sorry. go ahead, Paul. I think Commissioner uh, Paul would like for you to, um... go ahead, sir. Oh, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the question. That Tom, or, or not is a, is a term that they attach to a contagious um, mechanism organism. And it's the number of people that one infected person has the potential to infect, and 2.5 is, I think, is, is is high when you look at the flu. Is Luana correct me if I'm wrong? One or below, or like a 0.7. So it just kind of lends it, it kind of lends some some gravity to how contagious this organism is. I see. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question also. Oh, go ahead. Yes, sir. You, you go ahead, Commissioner Paul, please, sir. Um, I, I wanted to know if we're if we're not testing, do we have um, a method for determining that someone is assumed to be positive and then they would be treated as a positive even if they're not tested? How do we how do we do that in the absence of testing? So we really should assume that all people are positive just to keep ourselves safe. But the surveillance methods, methods that are going to be implemented is going to be another way that you can determine people who were not tested but are symptomatic. That, that's another method for determining, you know, people who are potentially ill with COVID-19. And, and how long before that's implemented and when it is implemented, will we receive reports as to how many people are assumed to be positive based on that method? I cannot speak to when those reports will be ready, but I know for the influenza-like illnesses, I receive those reports. And once I can get the COVID-19 reports, I'll be more than happy to share them with everybody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm good. Are there any further questions or comments for Ms. Luana? Luana, are, is, there, is there anything in the process that you know of or coming down to where somebody can be, is there a process to test to see if somebody has had it in the past? I mean, is that something that's being worked on or is that feasible or what's, your, what's going on with that? I believe that what's happening is um, medical professionals are very reluctant to use a test, um, to waste the test basically on people that either have passed or people that 
um, are recovering. Um, in fact, some of the tests that we have performed, we have suspected that the individuals were at the end of their symptomatic period and that likely that's why their tests were negative because their symptoms certainly spoke highly that they had COVID-19. But I guess to answer your question is I don't know that there's anything in process to use the test in that manner. Okay. So if we can't just go and test every person in the county and in the state and just lock them in a closet, how are we going to stop it? We have to continue to practice social distancing. We have to do our part and just stay at home and stay six feet away from people and um, everything that we can to, to prevent the spread. The more people you have, the more likelihood that you're going to transmit disease. So basically what you're saying, everybody should take responsibility for themselves and look out for number one. That's exactly the truth, because in the bottom, the bottom line of that is in looking out for yourself, you're also looking out for your family, your friends, and your neighbors. Oh, Ben. How would you <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to be able to smile and laugh about it. <laughs> I even brought my Clorox. <laughs> Good job. Ms. Luana, we appreciate all the work that you and your staff have been doing over the last few weeks, and I know that work will continue. And um, I think if the board doesn't have any more further comments, um, we certainly do thank you for um, your dedication. Thank you. Thank you, Luana. Our next um, presentation tonight will be um, emergency manager Justin Gibbs, and he will present to us a Hurricane Dorian recovery effort update. Thanks, Chris. Um, so this evening, I'm mainly going to talk about the uh, temporary housing program that, that's been ongoing as well as uh, public assistance, um, that process and where we are in that process. Um, but as far as the temporary housing program, as of today, uh, 12 displaced survivors are occupying their temporary housing unit. In, in total, we've issued 23. Um, we've got one additional uh, that would put us up to 13 that's ready to be occupied, but we haven't selected an occupant for it yet. Uh, the pace of unit deployment has slowed uh, because the outstanding cases either require placement in a campground or have extended transition dates with a high level uncertainty as to whether a temporary housing unit will be required um, during this uh, lull in placement. Um, steps have been constructed for all of the units that we have deployed um, as we await completion of infrastructure repairs in the campground and determining long-term needs. Um, of the units that are outstanding that are not currently occupied, um, we have 10. Uh, two are awaiting materials to complete uh, the temporary service, the electrical service, Four are in need of inspection by uh, the High County Inspections Office before meters can be installed. One is awaiting account creation. Uh, account creation, the recipient, recipient must call Tideland before a meter can be installed. And then three others are awaiting meters to be installed. Um, in addition to the issuance of the units themselves, we're also issuing uh, rental assistance. Uh, High County has dispersed $31,100 in rental assistance. Another $4,575 is pending issuance of checks, and an additional $6,900 has been referred to High County for payment. The, the grand total is uh, $42,575, and we hope that all those funds will be dispersed uh, by the end of the week. 
Finally, uh, Hyde County has requested two six-month extensions on Hurricane Dorian-related projects as part of our, our public assistance, one being debris removal and the other temporary facility expenses uh, related to the Ocracoke EMS station repairs. Um, now, I, I don't expect that we're going to utilize uh, those entire extensions uh, we may for uh, temporary facilities, but uh, as we know and can see, the, the debris removal is uh, pretty much complete at this point, um, but in order to compile all of the expense-related information, uh, we did request up to a six-month extension. Um, that pretty much completes my report of the recovery. Uh, are there any questions? I have, a, I have a question, Justin, regarding the debris removal. Um, I'm still occasionally hearing from people who are doing various kind of stages of demolition, and the assumption at this point is that the that the that boat has kind of left the dock and that they can't take advantage of debris removal. Is that true, or or can people still ask to have debris removed if they place it out by the road? I'll I'll defer to Chris on that. I know I've talked with with Corinne some, but uh, Chris is probably more updated, so I'll I'll refer that to the yeah. Commissioner Paul. Um, roadside collection has ended, and we will not be collect um, debris roadside anymore. However, if we have a situation where someone um, is in need of um, construction, demo, trash services, um, we have two options. One option is if the amount of debris is um, too large as determined by the building inspector to go to the convenience site, they may need to use a container. If um, they are required to have a container placed at their site, and they are currently in casework with the Ocracoke Long-Term Recovery Group, we can work with their caseworker to see if they could potentially qualify for a construction container to go on their site. So um, no, not through roadside debris removal, um, but through uh, either if it's, um, if it's a minimal amount, it can of course go to our convenience site. If it's an amount of debris that's too much to go to our convenience site, we will recommend a canister. If they're working through private insurance um, and not in the Ocracoke Island Long-Term Recovery Group casework, um, that'll be self-pay. If they are uh, in the casework and um, click and they um, have a caseworker, their case can be reviewed to potentially have some assistance to them in, in regards to the payment of a container. Does that, okay. does that make sense, sir? I, I, I think it does, and I may have to follow up um, regarding some specific cases. Sure, sir, and it Thanks. is um, very much case specific um, re in regard to each individual um, and where their, what their situation is, and um, we are, of course, happy to work with folks to find the right solution for them. Okay, good, thank you. Yes, sir. Are there any more questions for Justin in regard to Dorian recovery? The next item on our agenda um, will also be presented by Mr. Gibbs. This will be our tax collection report, and he has graciously agreed to present this in Ms. Bass Knight's absence. Thanks, Chris. Um, in your packet, you have the um, daily distribution reports from this year and last year for a comparison. Um, I just ran some rough numbers. Um, as far as overall collections of all taxes uh, for, for this year, we are down compared to last year uh, in, the, in the month of March. 
the total collections are down by $75,854.34. And then um, just the current county taxes, uh, the collections are down $34,266.15. As we all know, you know, this is most likely related to COVID-19 and uh, government operations as well. Um, but um, in comparison to last year, our, our, rate, our collection rates are down. Um, with that, I mean, I'll refer this report to the board for approval. Are there any more questions for Justin? Not do I hear a motion to accept this report? So move. I have a motion by Commissioner Swindell. So here's second. Second. Second by Commissioner Simmons. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, let it be known to say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. That ends our presentations for this evening. The next item on your agenda is recognition of an employee, a volunteer, or a friend of High County. This month, I would like to recognize everyone that was involved in the Rose Acre Egg um, Project. It was quite successful. Um, representative from um, Rose Acre, Mr. Tony Westner, um, gave us a call and asked us in light of the recent COVID-19 crisis, could we utilize some donated eggs from Rose Acre? And um, we gladly accepted that donation. And Ms. Jan Moore, um, who has been active in a lot of areas in the county, um, volunteered to head up that um, distribution of those donated eggs from Rose Acre. Um, Jan worked with um, Hyde County Schools. Uh, Superintendent Bass Knight uh, graciously um, jumped at the opportunity to deliver those eggs with the school lunches that were being delivered across the county. Um, and then we'd like to thank the school system from Superintendent Bass Knight down to the bus drivers and the volunteers that helped get those eggs into the hands of the families that were receiving the lunches. We also would like to thank the staff at the Mammoskeet Senior Center who also worked diligently to make sure that those eggs went out through Meals on Wheels program, which has greatly expanded since the COVID-19 crisis has started. Um, also, Brace in the Currituck Township and Miss Lovey Miller there was instrumental in getting those eggs out to that um, community. Um, the Ocracoke Island Long-Term Recovery Group and Miss Alicia Peel headed up distribution on the island through the Life Saving Church Food Pantry. We certainly appreciate their um, their support and efforts. And finally, um, Corey and Callie Carowin of Mammoskeet Seafood donated their truck and their time to take the actual um, delivery to Ocracoke Island for distribution. So there was a lot of people made um, that happen and we'd like to thank all of those who made those egg donations possible. Next, we'll have our public comments. Tonight, our public comment section will be a little bit different in regard to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we have allowed people to submit public comments through uh, online web portal and also through emails and um, a dial-in telephone number. At the time of the meeting, we had three public comments that have been submitted to the county commissioners. You have those in your package, as well as I am going to read those three public comments um, to you. The first public comment comes from Ms. Diana Williams of the Fairfield community. I would like to express my concerns about non-resident entry into our county. I have seen many folks in our area of the county fishing on the lake. People are coming into their hunting properties because tomorrow, Youth Turkey Day begins and runs until the 10th. After that, other hunters can hunt until May 12th, I believe. These people are coming from Raleigh, Wilmington, and parts beyond. 
I had a Wilmington resident riding around on my farm just the other day. We can't keep our population safe when others from hot spots are coming here. I've just ridden across the lake, Highway 94, eight vehicles there. One from Virginia, according to their license plate, and then a car from New York, a major hot spot. I actually took a picture of their license plate in case there was a question as to the validity of my statement. It's past time to get concerned about the health and well-being of our citizens. I would like to know what is going to be done about this issue. Our second public comment comes from a Mr. Mike Knowles, a non-resident property owner of Ocracoke. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My primary interest is with Ocracoke. I'm one of the dreaded NRPOs that everyone seems to think will be the destruction of the island. Our home on Ocracoke is just that, a home. We are not involved in the rental business and we use our home frequently. Our mainland home is on Lake Phelps and is more isolated than Ocracoke. I don't have a real problem with staying at our mainland home and I respect the decisions of the commissioners. My primary concern for the island is those that are allowed to travel to and from the island with no regard to the possibility of transmitting the virus. If the real concern is for the safety and health of the people in Ocracoke, how can the travel of residents, vendors, and especially contractors not be restricted? I know that repairs need to be made to residents' homes, but businesses can't be considered critical if there's no one allowed on the island. Some of the contractors are traveling from hot spots all over the East Coast. My fear is that there becomes a positive COVID-19 on Ocracoke due to all this to from travel and my family and I will be even further restricted from returning to our home. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be able to comment. I appreciate the situation that each of you are having to deal with and I thank you for that. Respectfully, Mike Knowles. Your third public comment this evening comes from a Mr. Dennis Osborne of Midlothian, Virginia. Mr. Osborne's comment is, while I understand the need for ochre coat to be repaired, allowing workers to come and go is increasing the risk to the residents. Are repairs more important than human lives? That ends our submitted public comments to the board this evening. We um, appreciate those comments and we hope that um, as soon as we are able to um, have in-person board meetings again that we'll be able to resume those. We can now move into our items of consideration. The first item of consideration is an appointment to the Albemarle RCD Council. Hyde County currently holds two vacant seats on the Albemarle Resource Conservation and Development Council. The Albemarle RCD Council recommends the Board of Commissioners appointee, formerly Mr. Dick Tunnell, to be named. The Albemarle RCD Council also seeks and recommends that a Hyde Soil and Water representative, formerly Ms. Allie Mulligan, be named. I would recommend to the board that we that they appoint Curry Tuck Township Commissioner Swindale as the Board of Commissioners appointee and recommend that the board appoint Hyde County Soil and Water District Administrator Ms. Debbie Cahoon as Hyde Soil and Water Representative. Is there any questions and or discussion about those appointments? Is there a motion to approve those appointments? So moved. I have a motion from Commissioner Simmons. Do I hear a second? Second. A second from Commissioner Paul. Now, is there any discussion on those appointments? Yeah, so we're going to end up having three representatives, and I see Pasqua Tank has like five, and Chevron <coughs> has three. Well, oh, excuse me. They have five, I guess. No, four. But I was just wondering how, how do we rate how many people are on that board? And, is each each person that's on that board board a vote of what's done with funding through the soil conservation service and should we have more people on that board so we can get more influence on that i don't i would just question that's a valuable question sir and um 
I don't know the answer because Ms. Debbie Cahoon has been typically the person that has um, worked with Albemarle RCD Council. If the board um, would like, we could potentially adopt these two representatives tonight, and then we could ask Ms. Debbie to work with um, our Albemarle RCD Chairman, Mr. Brian Lannon, to understand the board makeup and our representation to make sure that High County is adequately represented on the board. Um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to do that. Well, that give us three men, or would that just make us these two? Because those well, is, two. Um, is Allison Mulligan staying on or not? No, she's no. no longer here. So we're only going to have two then. Okay, sorry. She's yes, no sir. Here. Okay. She was our soil and water tech. That right. was the young lady that was our tech. Right. And um, so she's moved on to other employment, and uh, Mr. Dickey is, of course, no longer on our board. And um, they asked us for a commissioner elect and a soil and water elect. I don't understand the um, the makeup of the board. I don't know if it's potentially by uh, population or how they come up with that number, Ben. But um, if the board would be inclined to appoint those two representatives, I will have Miss Debbie to work to understand better how we are, how those seats are named, and what their, our representation level is. I thought that we had a lot of so many very valuable active drainage projects going on in the county right now and had hoped that through Commissioner Swindell's appointment that he could potentially be able to work with his constituents to add some drainage projects in Curry Tuck Township through work with the Albemarle RCND. And if we are able to put any more representation on that board, I'll ask Ms. Debbie to see if we can get any more representation on that. I just don't want us, if we, if there's opportunity there for funding, I know in the past there's been a lot of funding put into programs that were not beneficial to our area. And and so I just want to make sure we have a large enough voice in Raleigh and, and our region that if there's specific projects that work in probably our peninsula here in Terrell and Derry, I, I just don't want us to be losing funding because we don't have a loud enough voice. And, and, I, and that may not be the case. Uh, I'm just. You know, I think that it would be advantageous. And I also think that Albemarle RCND would love to come present to your board when our social di um, distance and restrictions are lifted. Um, they have been um, pretty um, adamant that they would love to get some more projects going on in Hyde County and I would um, like to get them here before you all so they can explain to you a little bit more about their services and how they can benefit us as soon as our social distance and restrictions are over. But in the meantime, I will have Ms. Debbie to work with um, RCND to find out how that breakdown is made. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, let it be known to say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carried. The next item on your uh, agenda is the resolution to ratify our COVID-19 proclamations and amendments. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Gibbs to present those proclamations. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, uh, as Chris stated, this is a resolution to ratify board action related to the state of emergency declaration for coronavirus 2019. Um, these actions are broken down into two categories. Um, the initial actions, uh, the state of emergency declaration, and also amendment number one, prohibiting visitation to Ocracoke Island. Those actions were originated by the chairman of the board. And then uh, the second category of actions were those taken by the Board of Commissioners collectively, uh, being Amendment 2, suspending public visitation to government offices and uh, limiting entry by Ocracoke non-resident property owners. That was taken on March 23rd, 2020. And then uh, the Amendment number 3, adopting the Governatorial Executive Order 121, uh, further limiting entry by Ocracoke non-resident property owners and prohibiting visitors from entering mainland High County. That action was taken on March 30th, 2020. Um, so uh, this, this resolution has been uh, drafted to ratify uh, those actions. 
Do I hear a motion? I'll make to, a motion. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we ratify those actions by the adoption of this resolution. Do you include both of those resolutions? Yes. Right. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Paul and a second by Commissioner Simmons to ratify the two proclamations uh, dated uh, 32320 and 33020. Is there any further discussion? Not all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> Motion carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Justin. The next item of consideration is the award of the High County Mowing Contract. Uh, before you start, Chris, I would like to ask the board to recuse me from this uh, discussion because one of the, the contract uh, bidders is my sister-in-law, which is so I would like to ask the board if they would recuse me from this because that is a family member. So we, do, Franz, we take a vote on that. To, you need to do a formal motion well, and a vote. Do I hear? Would Would somebody make a motion to re, recuse me from this discussion and vote? So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Swindell. Do I hear a second? Second. second. I don't know, you ought to be able to make a decision. I don't well, think that affects, you know, family. I understand. I have a second by Commissioner Paul. Is there any further discussion? Well, well, I'm the discussion is I'm just requesting this. The board doesn't have to grant it. Right. But I just feel like it puts me in a conflict of interest. Well, I, I feel very confident that you would make a decision one, the right way, whether it be a, your brother or your whoever. <laughs> well, anyway, I do too. Anyway. Can we vote? Yeah. If there's no other discussion, all those in favor, they can say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Now you can carry on. And I will not get to take part in the discussion. We'll vote. And I'm actually going to allow um, County Attorney Holsher to present this item. I thought I was talking about it, but I'll present it. <laughs> Thank you, the, sir. The um, action item is in your packet. Um, there is a summary sheet prepared by Chris. There is um, uh, the breakdown of the two bids that the Hyde County received is in your packet. Um, the draft contract um, is in your packet as well. Um, what's not in your packet, I guess, is the actual RFP that was sent out. When the RFP was sent out, it did include um, the actual mowing contract itself. Um, I guess what Chris would like me to do is talk about the things that she and I talked about as it relates to this contract. It's a service contract. It's not required to be bid by statute, um, by law, and it's all, you also do not have a policy that requires you to bid a service contract. So this process that you underwent was just um, to solicit um, interest, and um, there are no, there are no, it wasn't required, and there's no rules surrounding that process or your decision. In other words, um, and I'm not an, I don't know either one of these um, entities, uh, so I'm not an advocate for one or the other. I'm trying to make sure that my comments are as impartial as possible. Um, you don't have to award to the lowest bidder. Um, you can award to the highest bidder if you choose. Um, the contract requires uh, two uh, licenses, an L and a B. I have no idea what that stuff is, but it requires two uh, licenses. I understand that the high bidder um, possesses both of those licenses. The contract requires uh, your contractor to maintain those licenses. I understand that your low bidder um, has one of the licenses but is partnering with uh, another contractor and can partner uh, with that contractor um, that does have that second license and would be able to operate in that fashion. I asked Chris whether that was legal because I understand I'm the lawyer but I don't know much about that part of the law 
and I'm informed by Chris that it is legal for a contractor in this industry to use someone else's uh, license or to work under someone else's license. I understand that the low bidder uh, took the the uh, test that's required to be passed in order to have that um, second license today, and the low bidder should um, receive the results of that test within a week or so. And um, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is I would discourage you from saying, well, the low bidder wasn't responsive uh, because it appears because there's not a responsive requirement in this bidding process that you've um, undertaken. Um, just because the lower bidder doesn't have possess the second license, if the lower bidder is working under someone else who does have the license, I understand that that is acceptable. Um, so it, what I'm really trying to say is in the board's discretion as to which one of these contractors you want to award this contract to, and I don't believe that there's a legal ramification if you award the contract to either one of them. I think that's why Chris wanted me to speak, was to allay any fears that you were required to choose one or the other one. And I don't see in this scenario, in this situation, such a requirement. And I'll add that the license L, which many of you may be aware of, is a, um, a, a certification to spray herbicide. A license B is a certification to spray pesticide. And does this contract require to spray pesticide? Sir, it requires the, the bidder to um, maintain the license to be able to do herbicide and pesticide. But that's not part of the contract to apply to the pesticide or it is? I know the herbicide. Yes, it, it only says that um, on he, on our um, in our contract it only says they must maintain that license, but they have not typically in the past applied pest, uh Pesticide. Right, and so I would think that if you have a contract, if you're going to be bidding on something and you're going to apply a pesticide, it would say in the contract you're going to apply a pesticide. So, so really, now I've been. I want to start out by saying both. I know both of the people that bidded on this, and I think I hold both of them in very high regard. But I also know that I think the low bidder here before had a low bid for the county, and at the time didn't have the correct licenses spray herbicide and so they gave that bid up so well, we're not going to say nothing about that they went and got the herbicide license and now this time there is a new thing put in the contract that requires you to be able to spray a pesticide but there's nothing in the contract that requires to spray a pesticide i understand that yes. i understand because actually the low bidder come and saw me and, and I was like, well, if you're required to spray a pesticide, you should have that license. But if the contract don't say to, I don't understand it being in there. Um, but I do know also the low bidder called today and said they've taken the test and I know they've been involved with, um, I can't think of the guy with NCDA, um, Paul Ward. And Paul Ward, I know, gave them the test in private, even with the CDC or, or whatever's going on where we can't see each other. And the test has been taken. And um, but but anyway, I, I don't I don't know. I do I do think we need to review our contracts because I would hate to think that something was just added into the contract to make this person not qualify. And I don't know that that's happened or not, but I think it's odd that this person didn't get the contract one time for that, and they got the license to be able to have a contract, and now there's been something added in the contract that says you have to have the license, but you don't have to spray a pesticide. I, anyway, I just, I think that that's something we should clean up in our contracts, too. I, I think, uh, to sum it all up, um, I think both of them, both people now are operating on the split license. Uh, both parties. Um, so you have to look, whoever has the Lord's bid. I understand that's why you put bids out there. And they need to go ahead and get started. 
I done mowed my yard three times already. Any further discussion? Well, we need a, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to award the contract to the low bidder. I second. We have a motion by Commissioner Simmons and a second by Commissioner Toppin to award the contract to the lowest bidder, which would be Emily Cox. Is there any more discussion? I would just like to see us make sure that when we have a contract, I, I don't, I don't, I do not want to believe that anything was done in a certain way, but I just want to make sure that all of our contracts that are sent out are balanced. If it requires a certain license for herbicide, we'll require that license. If it requires a license, if they're going to be putting malathion out, then they should have the correct license. But I, I think that it's very important. What I understand, and it may be wrong, is that this contract requires to put herbicide out. The low bidder has the herbicide license. They do not have the right license to apply pesticide. But they are, they have taken the test, and it's in Raleigh being graded. And I'd, I'd like to assure you, Commissioner Simmons, the change in the contract was because of the change in staff. Right. Um, we changed our building maintenance supervisor, and um, he put, uh, he, he'd made some modifications to the contract, and that's why we have a, a difference in our contract this time, because he was, um, he was modifying our existing contract, and so um, we will definitely look at that moving forward. Uh, and, that, and that's great because we we don't want perception. It, it, we can all sit here and kind of drop stuff in our heads, but we want to make sure that we try to make sure we don't have that kind of perception. Yes, sir. In public or with anything. So thank thank you for that. I yes, pray sir. and I understand totally. All right. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, let it be known saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried with a vote of four to zero. Our next item of consideration is the award of the Solid Waste Services Agreement contract. In February, the High County Manager's Office issued a request for proposals for solid waste hauling services to seek bids from companies to provide hauling services from our six convenience sites. We have five convenience sites on the mainland and one on the island. A mandatory pre-bid conference was held on Monday, February 17th, and sealed proposals were due by Tuesday, February 24th. We received proposals from five companies. A selection committee consisting of our solid waste director, our utilities director, Two commissioners and the county manager ranked the five proposals under the following system. 30% was awarded for scope of services proposed and the cost of providing those services. 30% was allotted to the selection committee's familiarity with the company's service performance and their reputation. 20% was allotted for the indication of the financial capability to provide these services. 10% allotted for perceived responsiveness of the firm to Hyde County. 5% allotted for the successful operational record, past experience with providing similar services to other municipalities and or letters of recommendation. And finally, 5% was allotted for other things that were considered relative to the selection committee. Now, the proposal forms that were turned in by those five companies included prices for pulls of our solid waste from each individual convenience site and delivery to approved disposal sites in addition to the container rental fees. The selection committee compared all bidders' quoted prices by utilizing a model from past tonnage reports with actual tonnage reports over the years in order to see how effectively priced the company's proposal would be in a typical year of operation. After careful analysis, those proposed costs of services, the selection committee individually ranked each company and then those rankings were compiled. 
Republic Services of North Carolina LLC, based in Orlando, North Carolina, was the company selected to be interviewed by the selection committee. And after a successful interview, the selection committee recommends that the Republic Services be awarded the contract for solid waste hauling services. Tonight, I would recommend to the board that you authorize the board chair to execute this following attached letter of intent to contract with Republic Services and authorize the county manager and county attorney to work with Republic Services to negotiate that contract for solid waste services. There here a motion to approve uh, Republic Services to be our for a five-year contract with trash removal from High County. So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Swindale. Go here, second. Second. A second by Commissioner Paul. Is there any discussion? Are they, where are they based out of? All lander. Oh, sir. They, own, oh. they own the landfill, right? The landfill. Yeah. But I mean, now, do they do it much over in this region already? Yes, sir. Um, they do a lot of um, private container hauling here, and they're very well positioned to um, for for our service as well. Any further discussion? Do we have the money amount, anyway, or is it not really a dollar amount? Yet? It's not really a dollar amount, sir. It's based on pools. And so what we did was um, we were able to take the tonnage reports for the last several years, and we put each company's price per pool quoted um, into that tonnage report to simulate what a typical year with each company would look like. And from that analysis, which took us quite a bit of a time, of course, and then the other price is the rental container rate. And after a significant amount of financial um, analysis, we were able to determine that under the last several years, we would have um, received um, the most competitive pricing from Republic Services. And the pricing for this contract is very similar to what we've had with David's for the last five years. Is this, really something, is this something that we will find out before you sign it, the What's contract? That? We know that we'll know all the the bottom line figure there there's in that contract within well, the contractor they're charging so much to pull from ochre coat so much from ingle hard exactly so each each site is a different amount that they charge because they're different mileage from the but what i'm field. asking you is before you sign anything oh yeah that's so all we'll be able to see this contract before um Commissioner, um, County again. Attorney Holster and I will negotiate the terms based on the proposal prices. The proposal prices are solid in regard to pools, but there'll be a different monthly payment to that company depending on the number of pools. So you can't predict in advance it's we pay per state. pool. Yes, sir, we pay per, per pool. We don't pay by the month. So what we actually pay them at the end of the year is contingent on what they actually pull. How much trash they move. And it's in line with what the, what our projected pools are and are in line with what the last several years we have spent. We're not looking to increase our budget to haul trash. Yes, sir. We're not looking to increase our budget to haul trash, and that is very um, good for us this year. We were very pleased to get um, prices quoted that kept us in line with our last several years budget and not to go above and beyond what we're currently spending. Well, I guess that's what I'm getting to. Yes. Sir. Is have something to guide us through this. Yes, sir. So, for example, what you'll have um, from each company, from, from the Republic, is you'll have a what they charge us per pool from each site, and then they'll charge us that amount times the um, number of pools they make that month, and that their monthly payment. And I assume that, that, that really it'll be cheaper this year with the with what's going on Ochre Coat, you don't have there's three major restaurants going to be there, so that's going to be less trash they will pull. So the, actually, the, what the expenditures for the year, I think, will be less than it has been in the last several years. Yes, sir. And we used the last several years because last year was a little bit skewed in regard to um, trash collections in Ochre Coat specifically with the Hurricane Dorian. 
the one of the, the you know the key consideration from my perspective is service um as as you know we've had trouble getting the the containers pulled from Ocracoke and I know a lot of times it's hard there's challenges getting on the ferries and weather and everything else but um I certainly hope when that contract is put together that you will look real carefully at the language and uh, that that refers to you know what our expectations are for service and and we're uh, on the island we're very much looking forward to an improvement in the level of service and they were the cheapest yes yes they were and so um and so what we would um like to do and we would be happy to um what republic will send us their typical draft contract and we'll begin negotiations with them in regard to that contract and um, Commissioner Paul, I'd be happy to um, review any of those sections in regard to Ocracoke Island with you as um, the county attorney and I do negotiate that contract. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. The next item of consideration on your agenda is a memorandum of agreement between the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Agreement and High County. High County was um, lucky enough to have applied to the Office of Recovery and Resiliency for their state grant and state loan program for recovery efforts of Hurricane Dorian. The MOA for the state grant agreement is for amount of $500,000. This agreement shall be effective tonight or after approval of the county attorney and signed by the county manager. And um, the county attorney and I have discussed this MOA and he has, um, not to put words in your mouth, sir, but you approve of the MOA? Yes, ma'am. The agreement shall terminate on March 16, 2023. The grant funds covered in this MOA of $500,000 will be utilized to contract with an experienced individual to assist the county with our FEMA programs in regard to Dorian, to coordinate reimbursements, manage project documentation. This individual will also assist the county with the long-term recovery and resiliency planning and project implementation including um, identifying funding opportunities for resilient housing, resilient business recovery, and also resiliency planning. This is a three-year contract position. It's not an employee, it's a contract for three years. The second item that the grant funds of $500,000 will pay for will be to hire a full-time grant administrator that will work with our staff our consulting staff, state and federal partners, and individual citizen applicants to manage grant funding, including but not limited to our CDBG disaster recovery, our HMGP, our FMA, I'm sorry, um, hazard mitigation grant program funding, um, flood mitigation assistance project funding, our golden leaf funding, the office of state budget management funding, and other funding sources. Since Hurricane Dorian, we have been very blessed to have received a generous amount of funding from many federal, state, and foundational sources, and this person will help us to manage that money, do the reporting, and, um, and make sure it's properly reimbursed and accounted for. The third thing in the grant money was uh, uh, $30,000 to complete an affordable housing study for Ocracoke Village. So the, if, if you'd like to break this motion into two, um, the first motion I'd ask in regard to that is to approve the MOA for the grant funds between Encore and Hyde County. The second portion of this presentation is to approve state loan funds from the Office of North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency. The loan is in the amount of a million dollars. Comes from Encore to Hyde County. It's effective tonight, pending the county attorney has approved the MOA. And, sir, you have? Yep. Yes, ma'am. 
The agreement will terminate March 16th, 2023 as well. And upon or upon full expenditure of these grant funds. Now the loan funds are utilized for temporary cash flow to Hyde County. Um, the principal only loan does not carry interest charges. It does not carry admin fees. And upon our signature on this um, grant agreement, um, we will agree to the um, schedule that is attached for repayment. The completed transfer schedule is incorporated as part of this agreement. And this is a way that we will use to manage our cash flow of our Hurricane Dorian related expenditures, including debris removal while we await FEMA reimbursement. We have two uh, proposals. One is a grant funding for $500,000. The other is a loan for $1 million. Do you, would it, uh, I think, again, it might be better to do them separately. We might have to do them together, sir, because they're contingent upon one another. They're contingent upon one another. Yes, okay. sir, it's a package deal. Okay, if it's a package deal, we need to do them together. So explain to me about mm -hmm. the schedule I see of. Is this how you're going to receive the money on the scheduled loan proceed disbursements? Is that we're going to get so much each one of those months? No, sir. That is our payback schedule. Our our um our receipt schedule comes from um, reimbursable expenditures that we submit to them. Right. So we could very well re um, submit to them a million dollars worth of expenditures tomorrow because we have those. Right. And then that'll be our well, we payback. We have to have it all paid back by February 2023. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, sir. And we'll pay it back with the FEMA funds that we receive back for reimbursement. So similar to what we've done with Drainage District, getting the money and we'll be reimbursed through FEMA. Yes, sir. Now the 500,000 is a grant. That's just that just That is not payback. Just a million is, and with no interest is a loan. Yes, sir. That's right. And that'll be paid back with FEMA. Reimbursement, yes, sir. It'll be an in and an out. FEMA will send us the reimbursement, and it'll go straight back to NCOR. All right. Do I hear a motion to approve both of these memorandum of understanding? All right. We have a motion by Commissioner uh, Simmons and a second by Commissioner Paul. Ben beat you to it. Yep. <laughs> All right. He's got second. Probably I know he was probably first, but he's uh he's got another leg. Is there any more is there any discussion? All right. I, I would just say that that I'm for this based on knowing we're going to be refunded for payment. Yes, I don't sir. want us to pile up debt and have to pay it back by February 2023. As long as we feel confident that we're going to receive this back from FEMA, I'm okay with it. And I know that we've worked with FEMA through Fairfield Drainage, and it's worked good. In a very similar situation, we received a check from FEMA, we pay our loan back. And so yes, that's, the, that's the reason that I'm going to feel good about this one. This is a really valuable program that the State Office of Recovery and Resiliency has been able to offer counties that with limited financial capacity to help them get through that reimbursement process. And with the addition of the disaster recovery specialists, um, that'll be um, a great advantage just to help us add to our capacity and have more more and more staff to help us make sure those FEMA reimbursements are processed in a timely manner. And not to say that we won't, but whoever gets hired in these positions, I want them to understand that, you know, we're not looking to increase our budget. You know, we already have a hard enough problem, you know, so if we hire somebody, we got $500,000 to spend right now. In three years, I don't want them to, you know, say, hey, well, we had a, a different idea and hopefully if we get somebody and they're good, we can retain them and keep them. But I just don't want to obligate ourselves out beyond that half a million bucks. Yes, sir. That'll be understood in the um, interview and application and hiring process. Just like so many of our positions in the health department are state funded, um, the, the employees understands that that's a three year project and many times we work if that position is really valuable to try to find other grant funds to keep them employed, um, but it will only be promised for a three year term to deal with Hurricane Dorian recovery. So maybe they should find a grant to keep them a job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there any further discussion? Not all those in favor, let it be known saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. The next item of consideration on your agenda is also related 
in the fact that this is approval of job descriptions into our pay plan. So before we can create a position in our pay plan, we must have a formal board vote. I'm asking you tonight to adopt into our county pay plan the two attached job descriptions. The first one is for the grant administrator position that is included in the North Carolina Office of Resiliency and Recovery grant funds. And the second is for a land records manager. Um, the land records manager is a position that I am exploring trying to um, add capacity to our um, land records in the tax office. That would help us work through um, making sure that the recorded deeds are consistent with the tax records that are consistent with our GIS mapping. That's been an area um, since we have implemented the Farragut system that we feel like we need to put a little more time and attention to and um, this would adopt it into the pay plan so the manager can start working towards a plan to provide the county with a land records manager. And I'm happy to answer any questions about either of those positions. Do we have a motion to approve the job descriptions for a grant administrator and a land record manager? So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Paul. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Simmons. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, let it be known to say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. The next item of consideration on your agenda is the award of Community Development Block Grant Neighborhood Revitalization Professional Services Contract. The CDBG in our grant is a housing grant to elevate, reconstruct homes within the community. Attached are two rating sheets that have been submitted to you for the recommendation of professional services awards in regard to our CDBG neighborhood revitalization project. The request for asbestos inspection services was released. However, we only received one proposal and we are re-releasing that RFP for asbestos services. The attached two sheets represent ratings from Holland Consulting Planners, for both surveying and legal services. Holland Consulting Planners recommended that we award surveying services to Sorrel Land Surveying. HCP also recommends award of our legal services to Rodman Holscher, Peck, and Edwards. I am recommending the board award the professional surveying services contract to Sorrel Land Surveying and award the professional legal services contract to Rodman, Holscher, Peck, and Edwards. So I move. We have a motion to award the contract for surveying to Searle, Searle uh, Land Surveying and the professional legal services to Rodman, Holscher, Peck, and Edwards. Do I, we have a motion by Commissioner Simmons. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Swindell. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, let it be number saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. The next item of consideration that you have before you is the Ochre Coke Tram Operations Contract. The attached agreement is made between the North Carolina Department of Transportation and Hyde County. Now, the, the through the Ocracoke tram project, NCDOT purchased a tram system to help facilitate the passenger ferry project in Ocracoke. And as uh, Superintendent Halleck was um, indicated in his presentation, we were very pleased with its success where the passenger ferry transported over 30,000 visitors to the island last year. NCDOT entered to an into a lease and operations agreement with the county in October of 18 for that project. Now, as a result of Hurricane Dorian, the tram system vehicles were damaged beyond repair. And Hyde County um, has received authorization and funding from Golden Leaf to purchase a new set of trams. 
The agreement dictates that funds from the auction of the previously damaged vehicles will be used for the operation and service of that tram system. It also binds the county to participate in this project. The project consists of the operation of the tram system to be operated on Ocracoke and to provide access between the DOT ferry dock on Silver Lake and various stops around the village. The agreement supersedes our previous agreement. The tram system will be operated and maintained by the county through a private contractor. Partial funding for operation and maintenance costs, which is associated with the tram system, will be provided under a separate agreement between DOT, Integrated Mobility Division, and High County. And that agreement is 50-50. 50 percent of all expenses accepting maintenance of the tram stops and repair of the tram building door will be provided by DOT, and 50 percent will be provided by High County. In regard to the maintenance for the tram stops and the repair of the tram building door, since we published this package, we have received a um, notification from Golden Leaf that they will be supplying the funds to repair the tram stops and the tram building. So that's great news. Golden Leaf funding has been applied for and received. Now, under this, the county agrees to operate and maintain the tram system for the next three years, but only if the funding is available through federal, state, and local sources. And CDOT or the county both reserve the right to cancel the agreement within 30 days of written notice to either party. Tonight, I am recommending that the county man that you authorize the county manager and the county attorney to continue to negotiate this proposed agreement for the Hyde County Ocracoke tram system. And I'm happy to answer any questions, as well as County Attorney Holsher. County Attorney Holsher is currently working with DOT Office of Mobility on certain aspects of the tram contract. And so what you see may be changed um, per some of his recommendations. I'm open for any questions. All right, do I hear a motion to approve the uh, tram system operation agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation? Uh, if our attorney to let our attorney negotiate. Yeah, that I, I think you can approve it, you know, subject to possible revision. Yeah. Um, I got a PDF in mid-March of the agreement and revised it, and um, I didn't have a Word version, so it was difficult to send it to anybody in a format that they could see. And then I got a Word version late this month, and today I emailed um, in redline format at their request my proposed revisions, and they said they would review it and get back to us. But I don't want to play our cards out here in, in the public, but I think you can approve it subject to possible revision. I'll move we, I'll move we approve subject to possible revisions. I have a motion by Commissioner Paul, second by Commissioner Simmons to approve the the uh, tram operation agreement with the NCDOT pending possible uh, revisions. Possible revisions. All right. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, yes, sir. If you don't mind, uh, Chris, could you remind me the <clears throat> the funding structure for the operation of the trams? Yes, sir. The funding structure is 50-50 um, in regard to the operation with 50% provided by North Carolina Department of Transportation and 50% provided by High County. High County has received Ocracoke occupancy tax funds for that um, operation. We currently have appropriations in reserve that would allow us to operate um, at this coming year. However, we have also a requested from the Ocracoke Occupancy Tax Board um, a, an additional year's funding um, in the amount of $35,000 um, to hold in reserve for next year's operation. 
that 35 doesn't actually cover the 50 percent. Is that correct? Um, well, what we've been doing, sir, is we've been asking for 35 a year and holding it mm -hmm. in reserve. And we were actually able to receive 35 the previous year prior to the start of the tram project. And so that would be, you know, with our match, that's 70. And if you put together two years of funding, um, that would be the 140 that we need to operate. So we currently have enough in reserve um, locally from the OT board that we could meet the 50% match of approximately uh, 130 to 140. And of course, sir, the total amount that it'll cost us per year will be contingent on activity. And so um, it's not a set dollar figure for the operation of the year. It'll depend on the, the schedule. And of course, you know, Dorian um, came at the end of our season last year, which, you know, right when we were going to discontinue tram operations anyway, so we were right on target. We had a little bit of activity that was charged to last year from the um, October before, I think we supported um, a couple of uh, events. Maybe it was the Pirate Jamboree and some other events in the previous October. And so the operations cost was somewhere between 130 and 140 for that previous year. Coming up, we are really not sure right now when we will be able to start tram operations because of the COVID crisis. We have got a positive from the ferry division that we will, we have entered into a lease agreement for the passenger ferry and that we will provide tram operations in, in, at, in conjunction with the passenger ferry. But I don't think anybody knows right now, sir, when tram operations will begin because it's completely contingent on the COVID crisis. And so that is going to change the amount of money that this could potentially cost us for this year. And why are we executing a new contract with the state? Yes, is that sir, I'm because the trams were destroyed? Yes, sir, that's exactly right. The old trams were destroyed and the agreement under the last um, tram, uh, the last tram agreement between us and the state called for the state to own the trams and, and they were leased to us at a, a, a nominal figure. Now that the trams are actually being, uh, will be owned by Hyde County and they'll be purchased using Golden Leaf grant money. It has changed our relationship and it's therefore changed our agreement. And will we put the operation of the trams out to bid again in, in conjunction with executing a new contract with the state? The operation of the trams was a multi-level agreement, sir, and it's not due to be rebid during this cycle. Um, it'll be rebid at the end of its term. Um, so this is not um, in conjunction with the actual operations agreement between the county and the operator. This is actually just between um, the NC Department of Transportation and Hyde County. So these are two separate agreements. So I notice in this agreement that it um, requires the pro procurement and maintenance of appropriate insurances to include coverage for damage to equipment and liability and personal injury. Um, was that same provision a part of the previous contract? Yes, sir, um, it was. And we're still working through um, some of those um, some of the um, contract provisions with the operator in regard to insurance um, and our um, special projects manager, Mr. Bill Rich is currently working with our insurance company and our operator, not only to receive as much compensation for the damaged vehicles, but also moving forward to make sure that they're properly insured moving forward. But we were determined to have the highest level of coverage that we could have had 
on the other vehicles. It was a little bit of a discrepancy, sir, in regard to the trams being motor vehicles, licensed motor vehicles, or being a property that's not covered under a flood insurance policy. Um, yes, sir. Yes, please. I'm going to try to help uh, Commissioner Paul. I'm going to try to help Chris a little bit. She's doing a good job. Um, these are This is a very complicated uh, deal that y'all have and you have four agreements one is a lease of property where you're housing the vehicles one is a funding agreement with one division of the department of transportation and one's an agreement with this division of the department of transportation which was originally a lease and operations agreement the reason that this agreement is before and the fourth one getting lost is the operator's agreement with mr Joseph, and um, the reason this is before you is because the first lease and operations agreement was the state bought the trams. Uh, they leased the, the trams to us for a dollar, and they required us to have to operate the the tram system. Now, because of the trams were damaged to an extent that they're inoperable, um, we have to figure out what we're going to do and what Bill figured out we were going to do is he found a funding source which I believe is Golden Leaf to enable us to purchase replacement trams and what I think that what I think the Department of Transportation again we're dealing with two different divisions and they're not really work, working together but they are I think what they're saying is despite the fact that we're not leasing them to you and you now own them we need something an agreement in place which requires you to operate the tram system if you're going to get this funding from this other division and one of my revisions to this agreement was to incorporate the other agreement into this so that it all meshes together so I wanted to give you that information and as far as the trams go I've had a lot of emails and a lot of um, uh, discussion with Mr. Rich about how we got to where we are and again, it, the, the state bought the original trams and they were damaged and whatever loss is incurred because of that, it's the loss is on the state, it's not on Hyde County. Um, and w we're not happy about that, obviously, because they're our partners in this project. The insurance company, it went all the way up the chain as far as it could go. They even flew somebody in from Florida to uh, inspect the trams and see what the cause of the damage was. And eventually we have received documentation that, that defines what type of vehicle a tram is. And we we have been informed and been shown documentation that says that you cannot obtain flood coverage for that type of defined vehicle. And so those trams that the state was leasing to us were not covered for flood. And I think those are two of the main questions you were asking, and I thought that that information might help you with that a little bit. Thank you. And and do I take from what you just said that 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 determination applies uh, into the future as well? That that they these trams uh, going forward can't be covered for flood damage. Well, I want Chris to interject if she if I say something wrong. I think that we have explored alternate coverage. I'm not sure whether we have obtained from that alternate coverage coverage for flood for trams. And what we we are continuing to explore alternate coverage, Commissioner Paul, but we have also written into our um, applications with Golden Leaf and moving forward, we will adhere to this policy as a standard operating procedure um, that we will adopt and have executed between us and the operator. And that will be that at the um, call of a mandatory evacuation of visitors to Oprah Cook Island, the trams will be removed um, and, and moved to a safe place on higher ground on the mainland. And that's that site. Thank you, Chris. I remember this now. And that site has already been located and determined. Yes, sir. How about personal okay. liability? Personal liability. You mean liable, li liability for someone who gets potentially hurt on the tram? Yeah. We're getting as as much insurance as we can afford uh, to cover us in that event. 
How many does it carry? Hundred. I can't answer those questions. I mean, how many does the tram? Do how many people can get on the tram? Yeah. I don't. I have no idea. I've never seen them. It's fifteen, isn't it? Yes, sir. Fifteen. Is that right, Tom? Sixteen. About fifteen. I think it's twenty. Is it twenty? I'm thinking twenty, but yeah, in that range. And we modified our new, um, and I don't have it here in front of me, but after last year's operation, we had trams and trailers. And when we um, went through that last year, we had some key learning. And when we repurchased the new vehicles, there's a little bit of a different setup. And so we won't have trams and trailers anymore. They're just your standard trams with no pull behind trailers. And it, it's... It is somewhere around, I think, 15 passengers. Um, we're getting three and, and, and around 15 passenger trams, sir, and then one that has the uh, additional ADA compliance areas. Thank you. So we are carrying as much liability insurance as we can. I don't know the status of that. Uh, we'd have to ask Mr. Rich. I just remember the last emails that I saw, we were exploring alternate coverage and we were trying to get all the coverage we could. Um, I don't know whether that alternate carrier would provide what coverage or not since we've been told that it's impossible to obtain. I, I, I just don't know. And that's why I think Mr. Rich's second idea or solution to that is to require the operator to, if if there's a threat that that might happen, to get them off the island as quickly as possible to a safe location. I thought we had like I'm pretty sure we had liability insurance plus the operator had liability. We do, we we yes. have a yes sir. When we first set this up, the operator was required to carry a great deal of insurance, and we were carrying a great deal too. I remember Chris and I having both in person and. Uh, telephone conferences uh, with our insurance company about those issues. Any further discussion? Not all those in favor of motion, let it be known to say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. The next item of consideration on your agenda is the revolving loan fund pavement forgiveness extension. After Hurricane Dorian, the RLF manager, Mr. Bill Rich, requested the board forgive loan payments for six months interest-free to aid in economic recovery for all of our recipients of revolving loan funds. COVID-19 is crippling the spring economic boost on the island and it is also causing a great deal of loss of revenue and loss of tourism to our mainland businesses with this being our prime spring fishing season. Many of our businesses across the board are struggling and they will continue to struggle. RLF Manager Rich is requesting an additional 90 day, three month extension on all revolving loan payments, interest free effective April 1st, so businesses can continue to recover from both Dorian and COVID-19, payments will be scheduled to resume July 1st. So I'm asking you to please, um, I'm asking you to please extend our revolving loan payment forgiveness interest-free for all RLF grantees until July 1, 2020. Do we do we have any idea when they think <coughs> restrictions will be lifted for like tourism? I mean, is there a real? I know. April the 30th, Luana made the comment a minute ago that they were concerned about it happening. Do you think it's going to be, is Miss Luana still on? Miss Miss Luana, do you, do you have any idea when they're thinking about lifting the restrictions for travel and different things? I do not, Ben. What I took from Secretary Cohen's comment was that we might not need to be surprised if the governor extends that executive order on stay at home. And that order currently goes through what date, Ms. Luana? Um, April 30th. All I'm saying is I, I know that I, I agree with the extension. I just in my mind was sitting there thinking that if we get back to some tourism, maybe by June and then their payments come due, I, I was just thinking if we extend it till August 1st or something to give give people an opportunity to maybe rate, make some revenue. But 
when we got restrict the restrictive orders in place that does not allow people to to make money and, and, and do their livelihoods, I think it's an obligation of ours to maybe ease this burden that's in our power to maybe give them a little bit more time. I, I don't know. I, I am definitely for the 90 days, but I would would like for the board to consider maybe maybe August 1st, giving them another 30, praying that they'll get July 4th, you know, have a good celebration July 4th, have a good July, and maybe be able to make their payments August 1st. But anyway, I, I don't think Mr. Rich would disagree with that, but I, I don't know. I agree with you, Ben, and um, we can handle that one of two ways. Um, we can um, kind of follow um, the governor's pattern by implementing this until a certain day and reassessing, and if we need to extend it further, we certainly can. Or if it's the board's pleasure, we can extend it through and make first payments on August 1st and reevaluate that even in July to see if we're ready then. Take care of it now, and then we don't have to revisit it and, in July. And the only thing I would say is, you know, how many people have sat at home stressing since April the 1st, I can't make my payment, I can't make my payment. It was due April 1st with our last extension. Right. And and now here we are on six, we're gonna allow them to go further. But I just, it, for sure, if we're gonna do this through um, April 1st, in our May or in our June meeting, this needs to be on our agenda yes, to sir. see if we feel comfortable with letting it come due July 1st. I, I make the motion to extend them 120 days, make the payments due till unless, yeah, that's my motion. What's your date? August, uh, August 1st. So it, extend it one more. Extend it to August 30 1st. Days. So we'll extend uh, the motion. Thank you, sir. Motion to extend the revolving loan payment forgiveness interest free for all of our grantees um, a 90 days um, until August the 1st, 2020. So it'll be 120 have, days, correct? Yep. Yes, sir. We have a motion uh, by Commissioner Simmons, a second by Commissioner Paul. Is there any more discussion? Not all those in favor, let them be known to say aye. 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 Let's address all it in July. Motion we will. In case we're in the middle of this mess still. We will. I'll we'll take this back to you in July and we'll see where we are. Okay. All right. If, we have if, Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir. If you were interested, Mr. Rich said he was absolutely in favor of uh, an extension August 1st. I just texted him. Okay. Good deal. All right. We have three budget amendments before us, one for the health department, one for the senior center, one for social services. So we have a motion to approve those budget matters. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Simmons to hear a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Swindale. Any discussion? Not all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. All right, it's time for a manager's report. Uh, Commissioner Paul, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a month. Um, we started off the month uh, thinking we were, you know, moving forward well with our recovery from Hurricane Dorian, looking forward to uh, Easter and opening the island up. And uh, at that time, we were meeting with the planning board uh, for the purpose of proposing some relatively minor changes to the to the Ocracoke Development Ordinance in order to accommodate the placement of uh, travel trailers uh, in such a way that they could sit closer to property lines than the ODO currently allows for. And that's a piece of business that we're going to continue um, to keep on the agenda. And hopefully at the uh, at our next meeting, we can have that language for you. But unfortunately, as you all know, um, this COVID-19 thing intervened. And I don't think I have to tell any of you how much time we've spent on that. And then, um, uh, in addition to that, uh, I had some family business that I that I spent some time on. Thank you. That's my report. Okay, Commissioner Topper. <coughs> um, 
I haven't done a whole lot of work this month because I didn't want to get out, uh, try to obey the CDC guideline. But I did talk to right many people on the phone, and one of them was the, I guess he's the pastor of some of the churches down here in Angar. He lived in Man's Harbor. His last name is Mr. Haddock. Uh, yeah, Crab. Crab. Yeah, Crab. Yeah. Yeah, I spoke with him, and I, you know, on behalf of the board, uh, I hope I didn't overstep my boundary, but I know that they help feed, uh, provide, and work with the Albemarle Food Bank and supply a lot of food for a lot of families here in Hyde County. And um, I know that right now it's going to be a critical time that uh, a lot of the elder peoples can't get out and get food, and they're trying to provide food for them. And I just offered a hand, volunteer, um, and asked them if there's anything that this board could do um, to help him out a little bit. And, and he, he thanked me highly for doing that. But he said that the Apple uh, My Food Bank is pretty much set uh, very well. Mm -hmm. And that uh, right now, they're OK. But um, just keep you all abreast of some of the things that I'm doing. I wanted to share that with you. And he appreciated the offer highly. Um, the next um, problem that I have is I've been getting a lot of calls about outsiders running all over the county. And I hadn't really paid that much attention to it until I started getting the calls. So everybody was supposed to be in the house. And I contacted the sheriff's office to see what was going on that all these outsiders was in here running all over the county. And he advised me that they're not man, they don't have enough manpower to man those borders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I understand that. And he said they was trying to keep a lot of these recreational landowners out, but then they received the call to let them in. I don't know where it come from. I know we didn't do anything to change it. I mean, you talked about it on that. Uh, I don't think the, the thing that we passed did not say to keep uh, non-resident landowners out. It was just to keep visitors. That was not a part. Not non-resident landowners was not a part of that resolution we we did. Well, if you remember, and I this I know it don't mean anything, but my concern was uh, that whatever we did applied to the mainland as well. So I said, and this we cannot separate. And if you remember, I told you strong quarter from Engelhard, Engelhard from Okecoke. Uh, Fairfield from Strong Quarter, we have to do it as a county. And I said, now, as long as everything is done straight across the board, then I can support it. But if we're going to start separating again with this, then I can't support it. But anyway, they had, I guess they understood that uh, to stop everybody from coming in. That's what the governor ordered. And that's what they was trying to do. But lack of manpower, I guess he can answer that for himself. But um, that's one of the things that I've been beat up about. Um, these people coming in, having to run the county, and we're trying to stay home and do like we're supposed to. But um, I did get a chance to talk with the North Carolina Department of Justice. I talked with the uh, North Carolina Division uh, st uh, Standards Commission, uh, trying to see what we can do to get you some help. And uh, we we'll can talk about that later. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
Well, I believe actually that the governor did not have a travel ban in his state of emergency. It was just a stay at home order. There was a subsection three in there that says that to travel between residences and residences, including but not limited to the transfer of children in between uh, spouses. So it's kind of a broad. Yeah, but they're not. Broad, in, they, the state's not. In no, the they're not. And it was it said res, residences, so that kind of leaves that leaves it open a lot broader interpretation that allows you know, NRPOs to travel back and forth. And I would be happy to address that in my manager's report to add some clarity to those statements. <laughs> You have anything else? And then, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about was um, at the end of last fall, somewhere around December, I was brought to your attention that uh, Senator Steinberger was willing to help us to fund and put in place uh, a marathon program for the citizens of Hyde County. I don't know about you guys, but about dust dark, we are bombarding with mosquitoes starting already. And um, I would love to go ahead on and file suit, continue with that opportunity. Uh, he assured me that, that it would be funded. And I thank Ms. Ms. Gibbs, Luana Gibbs, uh, bought the information for you last year that it wasn't regulated. You don't have to have a license to use it. Uh, it's not restricted, so anybody can get it. And I would love to go ahead on and pursue that. Uh, see if we can't get something down here. Get some of the people out. The only thing I see with that, we need to have a distribution system and a storage, somewhere to store it. Well, I have talked with, uh, Guar, he got a big metal building up there. I don't know what's in it, but I talked with him like uh, last year about maybe a place to store it. And I think he said that we could make a corner somewhere in there. Who would be in charge of distributing? Well, that's something that we have to, right. once we get further into it, once I get the okay to go move forward, and once I get with uh, Senator Steinberger and talk with him some more, and see what direction we need to go, then I can come back and let y'all know. All I need is permission to, well, not, you know, I need uh, the board to say, okay, well, well, go ahead on see what you can find out, more or less. I think you get the information to us, and then we can decide whether, you know, you know, get all the details. Well, the information that you requested are uh, looking for about the restrictions and all that, we gave to you. Right. And, um, now, I mean, I just didn't continue with it because the fact that it was winter months coming up, we didn't have to worry about mosquitoes was bad, but now they're coming back. So I would love to go ahead on and continue with it. And especially with the kids out of school and want to play in the yard, it might be very beneficial to us. And it'd be often people something back on the mainland while they're out. Like I said, I think there's the, the distribution, you know, how much will each person get? How would they know? Well, that's something that we have to work out. I know. I mean, it's yeah. hard to sit here and say, uh, you're going to get a gallon <laughs> per acre. Or, you know, it's hard yeah. to do that right now because right. we don't have nothing. But that's something we can work on. We can work that out. Okay. And might okay. be you, you might be able to help me better with that than well, I think it's going to have to be distributed. It's going to have to be, if we're going to do it through the county, it's going to have to be done through one of our county agencies, the health department or, well, or something. Yeah. yeah. But I think that would have to be worked I out. I think the last time they did it through the health department. I'm not sure. I think they did. I don't know. Because you could go up there and get those little round pellet things. They even did that one year, last year. That is a that, that would come under a health issue. All right, well, just I'd say work on that and bring us some more information. Well, you is it okay if I go ahead and get with Steinberger and and uh, 
No. I'm happy voted on. That's a resolution. Well, whatever. Second. Yes, if you want to make a motion or something. Yeah. I think you might want to have a formal plan that would dictate some of the um, the program activities uh, um, before. That's what I was thinking. Before you really have it, you need to have a plan before you vote on it. A written plan. Well, all I want to do is have get it the support from you guys to move forward. I can bring all that. What well, I, think, I think that's what we're looking for. I think that if, if you can get us a plan to get, I don't think there's nobody yeah. here that would be against if you can get us free Malathion to help spray some mosquitoes. Yeah. So, but I but mean, that's all. Bring that's it before that, the board. That's all I'm asking. And then we can go forward. That's what I'm. That's it. I don't think nobody. Bring us a yes. bring us a plan, and then we can go with it. Well, I, I got to be able to go with it. That's my. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, I can do it, but it don't mean anything. Rather than me going to him saying, my board support me in this. I think that potentially Senator Steinberg would also appreciate a formal written plan. I've already met with Steinberg. Uh, I met with his aide. I've talked with his aide. Uh, done everything that I could possibly do by myself. So, so, what, so what would be what would be the next step then? What do you say? What would be the next step? <clears throat> once I get it, once once we get it locked in with it, he will fund it and he will get it for us. Maybe we have a date, then we can come back and say, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. Well, maybe. So do you want to go ahead? Do you want to come back with a an, a commitment from him for funding? Yeah, come back you with get a commitment, commitment from him. On the marathon, on the one or two. If you get a commitment from the senator for funding, then then it's easier to put together put a plan together because then you know how much money there is. You really can't plan it out till you know how much money you've got. Well, I'd we say had, get a we commitment. had dollar figures up to last. We had dollar figures up to last November, December. We had dollar figures. I think I think if you'd bring a proposal from him on how much he will fund, then we just go from there. Yeah. Um, get a get a commitment for funding. That, that's a great idea. Well, he, um, I think we need something in writing from him, not just word of mouth, that he would, how much he would fund. Well, whatever, what, all I need is something saying, okay, go ahead and fall. Oh, then when I come back, maybe next meeting, I can have it nailed down. I make a motion that Commissioner Toppin go to Senator Steinberg and get a commitment on how much he will fund for mosquito control. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? No, all those in favor, let me know and say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's all I need. Just I know. Uh, and you got any other thing you need? Oh, to uh, <laughs> um, Kind of got me sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to um, move on along with one of the other, yes, I, uh, I'll, I'll be brief in the interest of time, but I want to say I, I, I don't know the county and administration and the people in it have been tested more in the last six to eight months. Uh, than I can remember in my lifetime. I want to reach out and just thank the county government, what they've done, the policy they put into place. And I think tonight it was, was Superintendent Halleck's report. It shows the unique position we're at in Hyde County where federal, state, and local, and private industry and the citizens can work together to move the county forward and get these projects done. I think that's an incredible achievement in light of what we see 
uh, throughout the state, throughout the nation, wherever. And um, I also wanted to compliment the superintendent for moving as quickly as he did with their nutrition programs and, and getting and being supportive of the homeschooling aspect and supporting those parents and getting them through some really tough times and transitions. Um, the private school as well, they've, they've got some really great programs. They've, it's just, it's, it's been a strain on everyone, but they have achieved admirable results. And it's, it's just incredible um, what's being done in face of, of uncharted waters. And like I teach my kids, I said to be a citizen of a republic bears a lot of responsibility, a lot of personal responsibility. And we're going to be faced with things that that we don't even hear historical precedent in our lifetime. So we have to be adaptable. And um, anyway, I keep praying for this nation and for this county and for the kids and, and everyone here. And that's my report. Ian? Um, I, I wanted to start out too with the uh, schools. Um, and, and I don't know if you talked to the superintendent or not, but. Um, it, my, I was so thankful, you know, I've got two children that are homeschooled and I got two that, um, well, one in college and one that goes to the private school. And um, I, I was really thankful that the uh, public school system, uh, a couple of the ladies that were there actually called to check on my children to see about delivering them lunches and what they're doing now, making sure that there's good nutrition for the children, even though they're not in school. Um, my hat's off to them. I appreciate that. Um, the sheriff, I uh, thank you, sheriff. I know that it's been a trying time for you, and um, and I thank you for the limited resources that you're doing. I get to talk to your deputies just about every morning when I travel to Terrell County to work, and um, I know that uh, one thing I think that they shared with me, I'm pretty sure they did, um, that uh, actually some of these out of town license plates are people that are actually residing in. Hyde County currently. I know that I think I was told that two tags that were out of out of town on the Lake Road were actually people living on North Lake Road. And um, and I think the first day that we started this process, we had people that had that lived in Inglehart that had Texas driver's license that couldn't get to Dare County. Um, I appreciate the common sense approach that you and your deputies are taking. I was told that y'all turned like 22 around Sunday at, at Ponzer during uh, church. Um, just people down here and um, I don't I don't know what the answer is for all this, but I know you're doing a great job and appreciate that. Um, I commit, um, county manager, I'd like for you to, to know about what counties can come in our county when, when you get to your report. Um, and I also, I've asked several people to do this, and I would ask you as commissioners and anybody listening, please share with the people you know of our current situation in Hyde County, the problem that we have with health care, that we don't have health care, um, and, and to just ask visitors you know, kindly, say, look, please reconsider if you're thinking about coming, if you feel you potentially potentially could infect us. and. Uh, and I, I sent an email out to a, a, a friend of mine yesterday that I think was planning on coming. And when I laid out about a two paragraph thing about that, he never actually responded back. I, I think it upset him, but I think that that it may be hard, but just to explain our situation and don't put the burden back on expecting somebody to do it for you. Earl said it best a minute ago, you know, personal responsibility, you know, if, if we're concerned about getting sick, we don't need to go out. We may need to stay home, be more precautious. And also, you know, also the people that we know request for them not to come. So um, I don't know if we can put that out in our uh, on our website, but just saying, please, citizens of Hyde County, if you have relatives that want to travel here, please ask them to reconsider at this time and, and, and for us to do it together not just get mad at certain individuals. You're not doing this, you're not doing that. I mean, I guess the main effective thing we could do is we could blow the bridges in the event that we didn't want nobody to come, but then, then we pose the same problem when our residents need to go to another county to get groceries or medical, we run into that. So, so it's a difficult situation. We've never been faced with it before. And, and I'm like Shannon, um, uh, our county employees and our sheriff's department, they've done a great job. 
And I think we y'all have been very responsive to trying to keep these out of towners that, that are just coming here joy riding. And I appreciate that. I hope I didn't ramble on too much. Where's your mask? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, I've been to over here. <laughs> I haven't been to too many meetings because we can't have meetings, but we've done a lot of telephone calls and conference and over the last uh, last three or four weeks. Anyway, uh, I would, why well, would you mind just giving us a sort of a, a update on what do you think about the the number of people traveling and what's going on with the ones that are coming? If you don't mind. You have to use this microphone, sir. I'm I'm tired. And it is trying times. And uh my guys have been through some some trying times uh dealing with uh, people coming in this county. And uh it seems like the weekend is going to be the upswing. Uh, we we have uh, turned around 101 people at two step checking stations morning and afternoons. The morning has been the upswing of fishermen coming into this county. Uh, we've turned around 39 vehicles, and that was 101 people in those vehicles. Uh, nine of those vehicles was uh, in the afternoon and 30 was in the morning. Um, yes, yeah, some of the some of the automobiles coming into county have out of state, but they're checked and they're from uh, the surrounding counties, uh, Washington County, Terrell, Dare, or Beaufort County. I do have some problems with some um, some landowners or so so-called non-resident landowners that uh, get a text that says I want to bring come in and I want to bring two of my buddies to go turkey hunting and I tell him no. I said, if you're a landowner, if you bring ID, you can get in the county, but it's only you. Your buddies can't come. Well, then it's tune change. Well, I'm a central heating and air man, and I'm going to come and do some air conditioning work on my mother's property. And I said, well, you can come, but your buddies can't come. Well, these buddies become employees. This is the problem that I have with non-resident landowners. I need some direction from the board <clears throat> because I've told him no. Now, I don't know what the board wants me to tell them. I'm going to buy your, your ordinances. Maybe this would be a orders? good time. <laughs> Maybe this would be a good time for me to intervene and provide some clarification to the board on the actions that we've already taken. That would be a good place to, to, for everybody to clearly understand and there not be any misinformation. When we first started dealing with COVID-19, the board came together and we started to talk to the Ocracoke Control Group first. This has been evolving over the last month. We began to start with the Ocracoke Control Group and when Dare County put a restriction of visitors in Dare County, it was in the beginning of the crisis. It blindsided us somewhat. But we pulled together the Ocker Coat Control Group and we received a recommendation from them to close the island to visitors and non-resident property owners unless they were performing Hurricane Dorian recovery action. At that time, we had an emergency board meeting and we did decide as a board to implement a visitor restriction on the island and a non-resident property owner restriction on the island, except for when they were uh, signed an affidavit saying they were coming to repair their home. After several days of that restriction being in place, it seemed to the citizens of Ocracoke that there were still too many um, people on the island. 
and they came back together and they asked to further restrict the island restrictions to require non-resident property owners to have a building permit for access. That is where we currently stand with the island. We have a visitor restriction and restriction to non-resident property owners unless they have a building permit for Hurricane Dorian damage. We of course allow vendors and essential service personnel through the reentry program. And that, that is how we've covered the island. And then we began to talk about the amount of people that were coming into the mainland from out of county and out of state, specifically for fishing purposes, as it is spring season. And at that time, your board, the board passed another declaration, which you approved tonight, that would clearly restrict visitors from the mainland. This proclamation, as you can read and you adopted tonight, restricts visitors. It does not restrict non-resident property owners. If the board is so inclined to restrict non-resident property owners, you can make another proclamation to do so, and that would be your next step to further restrictions. But as of right now, you have a restriction on visitors, not non-resident property owners. Um, how we in, implement that with the sheriff in regard to in regard to how many people he allows with non-resident property owners um, to come in. Typically in Ocracoke, we also strengthen the non-resident property owner restriction to say that every person in the vehicle has to be permitted to come in. And so I'd be happy to clarify that working with you in regard to what the board's proclamations are, or if you would like for the board to potentially um, consider other restrictions, we can take those to them. But currently what we have is we have a visitor restriction on mainland High County. And the next step would be to potentially have a non-resident property owner restriction on High County. As far as enforcement guidance, I would be happy to work with you on that enforcement guidance. And one of the ways that we have done that on the island is that we have required, as we have tightened down, that each person within the vehicle have that, that, that verification. They have that reentry tag. Um, and so that has been, and that is how we've done this process because COVID-19 is something we've never been through before. And I think this board has kind of taken this incrementally and they've made restrictions and then they may have tweaked those restrictions and tightened those restrictions. And um, we're happy to do that. And we're happy to bring those solutions to you. Right now, in regard to the governor's order to clarify, the governor has issued a stay at home order that's that's not being enforced, but it has been adopted, but he is not enforcing the stay at home order with law enforcement personnel. The governor's order asks you to stay home unless you're unless you are involved in essential uh, job, you have an essential job, that you're doing essential shopping that you're going to a doctor visit, a pharmacy visit is included in the order, or also for outdoor recreation. But that is not being enforced. It has been adopted, but not enforced. Hyde County has the restrictions that I've already reviewed with you. In the state of North Carolina right now, Dare County, Currituck County have the highest level of restrictions across the state of North Carolina with both a visitor restriction and a non-resident property owner restriction. Hyde County is just slightly less strict with that restriction in regard to we have both visitor and non-resident restriction on the island. We have a visitor restriction on the mainland. The, um, also, Graham County is um, enforcing a visitor restriction and the Cherokee Nation is, is enforcing a non-resident property owner and visitor restriction. So out of the 100 counties in, this, oh, in the town of Beaufort is restricting visitors unless you're from Carteret County. So out of 100 counties in the state, less than 10 have any travel restrictions at all. 
and only four right now are enforcing those travel restrictions. One of the problems with enforcement of the travel restrictions is manpower. To set up a 24-7 um, police per, per barricade at every entrance into the county would require enforcement personnel above and beyond what we currently have. And our solution to that was to have, um, how would you say, random traffic stops. And we geared those traffic stops around when we knew people were coming in, early morning and late afternoon. Um, in hurricane situations, we can shut the county off at its borders because we can request National Guard, which we are not, we, we don't have access to now. We can request State Highway Patrol, which we also do not have access now. And we can request mutual aid from other counties. Um, those are not available to us right now as this is a statewide crisis. So um, just so everybody understands, um, High County currently has probably uh, has some of the most restrictions in the state in regard to travel, and we have some of the most enforcement in regard to the state in regard to travel. Um, and so I want to make that clear that um, we that's where we are in regard to the rest of the state. And I'm happy to take any questions. And if this board wants to continue to look at potentially strengthening those restrictions, I'm happy to bring those to you. Can I just add, Chris, that we're benefiting greatly from uh, Dare County's enforcement because they've agreed to cooperate with Hyde County uh, at their roadblocks. And so anybody who would, would otherwise be headed for Ocracoke uh, and doesn't meet our restrictions is being turned around by Dare County enforcement. And they're uh, being very good about monitoring uh, the, the folks who are coming in and complying with our, with our restrictions. We're, we're very grateful to Dare for their help in that. Commissioner Paul, I'm very glad that you mentioned that because we have been in constant coordination with um, Dare County, with Dare County, Beaufort County, Washington County, and Terrell County as our neighbors. And it's been important to us that we allow those citizens among those bordering counties to have access to the other counties. Many of us here have to travel to those other counties for doctor's visits shopping and employment and vice versa. So we've been working to make sure that we have open borders amongst Hyde County, Beaufort County, Washington County, Terrell County, and Dare County, because we are so contingent upon each other for services. I will tell you, I spoke to um, Christopher Williams this afternoon at Christie's Grocery in Swan Quarter. He had came to me with his concerns about the number of people that were in his store last weekend buying fishing license and worms and, and other types of recreational gear. I asked him if he felt like the visitor restriction and the um, random traffic stops had helped, and he said 100%. He said, all my minnows died but I think that we're getting a lot less people in here. And so um, I have not had a chance to go to Fairfield and talk to um, the business owners there, but I will tell you that our bait and tackle shop owner and grocery store owner here in Swan Quarter said that the visitor restrictions, he has seen a great um, improvement in the number of out-of-town people. Now, I don't think there's a playbook for this. And I think we've all got to work together and it's very fluid and um, we can continue to monitor the amount of people here, but in the end, it does come down to exactly what some of our board members have talked about. That's protecting ourselves and having personal responsibility and maintaining that we wash our hands, that we maintain social distance, that we only go necessary outings, that we do all these things that we're being asked to do to protect ourselves and to protect our own families. Art, have you got any suggestions of anything that could improve what we have? The only thing that, that I would probably add is, and, and Chris has already covered that, if we had some kind of reentry for non-resident property owners that I can see. That you could have something to, some 
yes. evidence or proof to, to yes. go to turn them around. Or because them it's trying times and people are going to try you. Yeah. And, and uh, in Dyer County, they're putting people in trunks of cars trying to get them that. through. Yes. yes. And they put the cars on rollbacks and yes. trying to get them through with different yes. out of things. Any, any, anything wow. that they can. Well, I had one of my cousins out of Baltimore, of all places, where it's real mad. Tell me he was coming down to my aisle. I said, no, you're not. Well, first thing, if I'm at it, he's not. Well, let me tell you what happened Sunday. We had, had a, a, a truck pulling a boat, come from Virginia. Come through 264. We turned him around, told him that he needed to leave the county. Uh, and I was at that traffic stop and I left there and went to Firefield to check on those boys up there. It was probably about seven o'clock and I got up there about 20 minutes later <laughs> and he drove all the way around Columbia and came back up 94. I think he was surprised when they saw the blue lights at CF Road. But People will try. Now, I will tell tell the board that of the people that we have turned around, we have had no problems. No problems whatsoever. One or two might get mouthier once in a while, but they, and even the first, after the first day that we started doing uh, some checking real hard, we checked the lakes and the boat ramps and those people that were on the lake and at the boat ramps that weren't supposed to be here, they picked up their stuff and left. But there are some some cars and trucks in here that don't that have Virginia license, and uh, the one from New York, he's from Plymouth. He's got a Plymouth driver's license, and he's got a Plymouth fishing license. So I can't turn him around. I, we did tell him he needed to get a North Carolina driver. <laughs> Tag on this well, no, Mr. Shoemate, could you offer us any assistance in potentially creating a non-resident visitor uh, pass protocol like we do have on the island? What would that look like? In hmm. <laughs> I know, and I'm so sorry because I have worked Donnie almost 24/7 since COVID started. But Donnie's in charge of our reentry program on the island, and it is a very well established program we use for hurricanes. All the 116th ownerships and all the crazy stuff that we got going on. I don't, I don't think, uh, I mean, that could happen, but I, I think the ones that these are the ones that's got the big houses on the lake shore and that's but the one I'm dealing with right now he his his mother owns nine acres up in the Slago area and he's got plan A, plan B, plan C and it probably go right on. I mean it doesn't help us right now, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to implement the reentry tax system that we've got and we're going to put a name forward in the future, but for this particular incident, we could do the online application system for the temporary pass for this situation. I doubt it would be much different. I would, I would wager that it would be less volumeized because of all the stuff we have going on. For us to deal with on that. Mr. Shoemate, could you sit down with myself and the sheriff tomorrow morning and we could talk about some standard um, procedures for reentry? And we'll provide you with as much guidance as possible under the current order, Sheriff. And if the it's board. A tough one. It is. It is very, very tough. But I will tell you um, in my discussions with Manager Alton in Dare County, he said that he knew that some people would slip through that people would not stop trying and people would slip through his 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 restrictions and his effort was to try to stop thousands of visitors and some may slip through but if they could stop the lion's share of them in he felt he was being successful i think you've been uh, i think you've been successful uh, I mean, I, it I, may I, not be a hundred percent but you i don't think we're I, I by no means we're not a hundred percent but 
it's a whole lot better <coughs> today than it was last week. I agree. Like, and that word was spread too. Yes. I but I, I just need some guidance from the county commissioners. I'd really like to know y'all's feelings about the non-residents. I mean, I, I've got one non-resident property owner that lives up to New Lake. He brought his uh, a water bill and he's he's been up there and I have had no problem. Well, when, I've only had about probably four, four at the most property owners that have come through a checkpoint that says I'm a property owner. And I know that property owners have got some business to take care of in this county. And, uh, well, the, the property owners that come, just say like this turkey season, they have their own homes. They pretty much stay in them. And when they go out, they go out in the woods or the fields hunting. So they're really not making a whole lot of contact with anybody, are they? Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're no still making contacts with, with in, in the grocery stores and. Um, well, I mean, how many places of contact? You got Chris's grocery, you got the, uh, the gas bar. And the grocery but that, but Earl Jr., that, that's the ones that I'm getting calls from saying there's an influx of people know, in the county. I know. I've, I've got. <laughs> but see, if Chris got infected, if his grocery store got infected, Look at all the local people that go there from everywhere, all the way from Angola. Yeah. What <laughs> and a, then he go back to Tommy Etheridge. What the thing and about many people go in there, yeah. you know. Well, the thing about this this virus is we have more people that are living in the county that travel outside the county every day. And I agree with that. And they go to grocery stores, they go yeah. to Lowe's in Washington, they go to the doctor. And what's to say that they can't bring it back? You're right. I mean, and there's more of those than there are visitors. You have more local people going through your traffic stop I, than you do visitors. I do. And They're so, going both I mean, ways. The, volume, yeah. the main volume of the traffic is, is residents that are going out of time for something and then coming back. And, you know, and I'm, but we people say that choice. outsiders are going to bring it in. The more people you had, more chance you got it. But it could be brought in here. And I think it's already here, to tell you the truth, just that and have a positive. I, I think I think what this Mike Knowles said said if the real concern is for safety and health of people, how can how can the travel the residents travels and the vendors, especially contractors, and not be restricted? So if you got a contractor that brings a load of wood from New York to Ocracoke or or in, I think slowing it down is your hope. And and I and I maybe Luana can answer this, but I don't think the goal is to stop. The virus is to slow it down so the healthcare system can handle it. Mm -hmm. and, and I may be wrong. I'm not a healthcare <laughs> provider, but I don't. I think, I, think that, I think that I think that it's like I, I I really I really feel a lot like Earl. There's been a whole lot of people really really sick with respiratory illnesses in the last several months. But but I, I I'm like you. There, there's enough people that I mean I had somebody that complained to me the other day and 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 they had been to Greenville. <laughs> and they're talking about people being here, and I'm like, well, 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 what? You know, well, we had to go up there and we had to go shopping. I said, you know, I, I think what you're doing has helped a lot, and I don't know, you know, I'm a, I'm about like old Mike Knowles there. I guess I kind of agree with him that you know the only way to be safe is to, to blow the bridges, <laughs> not, okay, and not let none of our residents leave, and don't let nobody come in here. And then we just all figured out right here by ourselves. Yeah, but we got to go. I got my no, no, no. I got to go doctor. You might week. infect somebody. <laughs> you may be infected. Okay. You need to keep your butt at home. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, I, I think that there's, there's got to be some common sense. And I think there's been common sense. And you slowed it down when you go from 80 something. Did somebody say they counted 80 cars on Lake Road or 72? There was 58 at Six, last night. Uh, 60 yeah. something that week. My guys counted one. Right. And then that. then it's gone down to eight. And I mean, that, and, that's huge. and those those eight are probably from uh, Washington and Terrell County. Right. I, I mean, I don't I don't know I don't know the answer, but I but also I think that you also got to have some common sense about the whole thing too. And the main well, thing if, is if, got to look if I got common sense, this guy from uh, Apex he ain't coming because I'm telling him no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to tell people too. With, common sense. <laughs> with with can, can I just comment on uh, on Ocracoke and you know the role of common sense? Um, it's been it's been really difficult in our 
our control group has, has worked really well and, and spent a lot of time um, discussing these issues around and around uh, and, and coming to what I think are the right conclusions. And the fact is, we have a situation here where we're dealing with two crises, not just one. We're trying to get the island put back together after Hurricane Dorian at the same time to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And so it's been kind of a balancing act. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we've done the right thing. It's been difficult. And I know that, that the, um, when we tightened up the restrictions on the non-resident property owners, and we went from, you can come in if you sign an affidavit saying that you're working on your house, to you can only come in if you have a building permit. I know there are a lot of people disturbed by that. And in part, I, I know that some were disper disturbed by uh, a statement that I made that referred to uh, some, some of the non-resident property owners gaming, I use the term gaming the system. And uh, we know it's true, we know that that happened. Unfortunately, um, uh, a good number of the non-resident property owners took that very personally and it wasn't meant to be a, a personal attack on uh, on all of them, only those ones. And, and we know we know very well that this that this happened. I mean, they they sign that affidavit and say they're coming to the island to to work on a house, and they show up with a, a boat and a pickup truck with a bunch of fishing poles and two or three of their friends, you know. Uh, and and we know that happened, and and so that was why we had to make that change. Um, but it it's hard, and it, it's hard to apply common sense to a situation where there's really no good answer. We're doing the best we can, and Guire, your guys over over here are doing a great job, and and uh, yeah. the ferry division's doing a really good job for us. And and also, I would I would say, um, Donnie and and Teresa have been terrific, and picking up, uh, starting all over again where we left off following the hurricane, with kind of reinventing that reentry system, and then creating a system of enforcement and then everybody working together on it. It's been a lot, a lot of work. And um, I, I really appreciate everything everyone's done. And we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to make common sense a part of it. Hey, and, all, and I mean, I just, something to realize all the way around us, it says Carteret County just reported its second death from the coronavirus. That's where one of your ferries goes, Tom. I think Dare County has six confirmed cases. Uh, Washington County, I think, has two confirmed cases. I mean, it's all the way around us, and I, I swear I believe it. We ought to, I think we ought to mandate tonight that we blood test everybody in this county. <laughs> they got, they got, I'm telling you, I think that's the only way you get a reality of what's going on. I agree with you. It would be. Make everybody pee in a cup, we'll drug test them and check them for corona at the same time. <laughs> Franz, I got a question. This is, I mean, I just want an interpretation. I think I know the answer, but I'd like some clarification because I've had. Somebody told me that, you know, this for outdoor activity, that it, in the governor's executive order, it, they said fishing and hunting was not included in that because they're reading it word for word. But let me, let me, have, have you read that outdoor activity? Yes, sir. Um, it let, says let, but, let, before you can, limitation. And that, I, I know you're the chairman. Yeah. But you're you getting ready to ask me a question that is being I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you're asking me a question that's going to have an answer, and you, I want to make sure that you want it to go wherever it's going through the Viral. Facebook. Sure, I do. Okay. All right. But all right, but what it says, it says for outdoor activities, this is in the governor's executive order. It said to engage in outdoor activities, provided individuals comply with social distancing requirements and mass gatherings as defined below such as by way of example and without limitations and it said walking hiking running golfing or biking now with that order that does not specify that those are the only three the only 
five things you can do because hunting is an outdoor activity, fishing is an outdoor activity. I'm just asking you. So that doesn't exclude fishing and hunting, does it? I think the language that you read, you might have paraphrased a little bit. I think it says it says recreational activities including but not limited to. It says by way of example and without limitation. Without limitation. So whoever wrote that said here here's some examples of recreational right. activities and this does not mean to say that these are the only recreational activities okay. your sheriff and i have talked to um the the district attorney for this district on a similar question about this and um when guar called me before we talked to the district attorney about something that guar was trying to deal with i read that language and said to Guara that um, if you can hike, I think you can fish. I think you can hunt. Um, well, what this was just an example. It wasn't limited to those examples. Right. It says because it's uh, without limitation. So that means it could any basically any or outdoor activity. Well, you're trying to just figure out how you define what recreational is. Right. And I, my point was that if if you can get in your car and drive, say, to Hyde County and go on a hike, I don't know why you couldn't drive, get in your car. And that's a recreational purpose and why you couldn't get in your car and come to Hyde County and hunt or fish. Yeah. Now, I don't know how you get in your car with more than one person and observe social distancing. Um, that's a little bit well, difficult unless you bring a whole bunch of cars. Well, I, no, I, the thing I was getting at is, is I've got a call that says it doesn't say you can hunt, doesn't say you can fish. I mean, they're just taking it literally. These are the only things that you can do under the governor's order, but that, it doesn't limit it to just those hiking and... I think the reasonable fishing. interpretation is that recreational activities would include fishing and hunting. I would too. Okay, I, I just want to make sure I would... Well, I think it would be closer. better if you went hunting because I heard today that, that a tiger had it. And like, if if you give a deer the coronavirus, you probably should just kill it. But so you can only be, from, but you can only be from Beaufort, Hyde, Terrell, and Washington. Or a resident landowner, True. or a non-resident landowner. True. Okay. All right. You got a report? I've done one. <laughs> Does anybody else have a report? So I mean, well, I do. We had talked something about. That hunting the turkey season that they asked could could we could we do away with turkey season i said no that's the wildlife resources commission <laughs> and you know i just don't think that after you've seen after i've seen pictures this weekend of young people out there hunting and their parents with them where they killed a turkey i don't want to be a part of even trying to do away with turkey season so anyway that's all i have anybody else have anything else here a motion to adjourn i'll make that motion Second. I have a motion by Mr. Simmons and second by Mr. Swindell to adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Aye. Good night. Been a pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Be safe. Uh, tell me when we're all. Uh,